to call. Oh, I, I got an echo. Hold on. Did anyone else hear that? Let me, let me put my headphones on. It may help. Is Jeff on? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just. Okay. That may be better. So, 903, I would like to call this November 19th meeting of the SUNY Erie Board of Trustees to order. May I please have a motion to do so? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You have um, before you our agenda packet. And um, we're going to go through, but we do have a few just small adjustments we're going to make due to the recent news from our governor. So before we do that, and um, keeping in line with uh, uh, past president or past chair Lynn Linehan, I would like for any uh, someone to read the mission statement. And because we're in this um, this setting, if you don't mind, I'm going to pick someone, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a trustee member. So get ready. So I'm going to pick Fabio to read our SUNY Erie mission statement. Certainly. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. SUNY Erie meets the needs of a diverse student body and contributes to regional economic vitality by providing high quality, flexible, affordable, and accessible educational programs committed to student success. Thank you. Fabio, I thought of you since you were you you were very busy this week with us. <laughs> so I thought it was only right that you had that honor. So with that being said, welcome everyone, all of our international viewers. No, I'm just joking. There's a problem. <laughs> International. <laughs> but just in case we welcome you too. <laughs> no. But I would at this time like to turn um, the meeting over to, well, actually, sorry, Kate, I need you to do the role. I'm yes. sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, Todd Hobler. Here. Lynn Lenahan. Here. I am here. Carrie Phillips. Here. Jeffrey Stone. Here. Susan Swartz. Here. And Denise Wilson. Here. Travis Poling, our student trustee, is excused, uh, so we have a quorum. Okay. Thank you. We have a quorum, and I realize I did that all out of order, but I think we're okay now. Okay? <laughs> Forgive me. I, it's a learning curve, guys. Okay. So like <laughs> now I would like to um, have interim Bill Ruder, as well as Amy Yoder and Mark Pacolic. Did I say it right? Cholik. Pacholik, I'm sorry, Pacholik, I won't mess it up again. Um, present for, to us, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I pass uh, Amy Yoder and Mark Pacholik to provide the trustees a brief overview. Uh, as you're well aware, we are in an ever-changing environment as we uh, ensure the safety and health of our students, staff, faculty. We are on probably a call a day, as well as multiple emails a day, getting guidance. As you know, the region uh, was, uh, went from yellow to orange late yesterday. Every one of our campus locations is in that zone that turned orange. Originally, we were given information uh, through the uh, SUNY from the governor's office that just made a blanket statement about schools and between Amy, Mark, and I, we kept on pressing and, and pushing for more specific guidance on what the definition of schools was. And we received that late yesterday afternoon. And throughout the rest of the afternoon into the evening, uh, the three of us, main, I shouldn't even say the three of us, Mark and Amy worked feverishly and then brought in uh, Paula Sandy. Uh, to craft a message that would go out to the college community, identifying and informing them exactly what is uh, where we are. Again, this is an ever evolving situation. This this will be discussing where we are as an orange zone, 
not a red zone. And I felt that uh, with the board meeting, it was it was necessary for the board to have a full understanding of where we are. And then certainly we have uh, inter an international audience attending today. So I felt from an international perspective, we need we need to let the college community know uh, there are questions already being asked. Again, it's a, a changing environment, but Amy and Mark, I have said multiple times, not only at this meeting, but it other, in other forums, without the two of them providing the guidance to the college through the pandemic, I honestly don't know where we'd be. They are truly uh, pillars of strength. And I've, uh, I would like to just turn it over to them and they can just give a, a brief overview and respond to any questions you may have. So with that, I will ask Amy and or Mark to start off. Thank you, Interim President Ruder. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for allowing us to be here today. Um, I'm going to take advantage of this forum. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, we have a lot of information to get out, but I wanted to make this as quick and concise as possible, but be able to keep everybody very well informed about this ever-changing environment. Um, I thank you for your kind words, Bill, but this has absolutely been a community effort. Um, I'm, I'm bringing back and emphasizing that word community in Erie Community College, because if we weren't all rowing in the same direction, we wouldn't be here and be almost completed with the fall semester and face-to-face -face classes if we aren't, weren't all working in the same direction. So I thank so many people. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm a visual learner, um, so I'd like to get this information so that you can all see it. Bear with me one second. Just could you tell the board what your role is? You were not hired as our <laughs> co-chair for the COVID task force, right? No, that is correct. I am actually okay. the dean of students at South Campus. Okay. Um, I was you. hired in uh, July 2019. Um, but I do have a background. Um, I have a master's degree in health services administration with a concentration in epidemiology. So ironically, it worked out pretty good. <laughs> so it, it, can you all see this, Bill? Can you just give me a thumbs up? Okay, great. Um, so first and foremost, I do want to thank the volunteers. I know I didn't mention that um, this is a community effort, but we do have um, over, um, let me make sure I got the right screen. We have over 84 volunteers who are working on this continuously. Um, from pool testers to contact tracers to call-in schedulers to running our checkpoints. Um, again, this has been such a community effort, and we will be pushing out um, an ask for more additional volunteers as we move through this. Um, we have a call-in COVID test line um, that is getting about 70 calls every 20 minutes. So that's a lot, um, and, and that's good that we have that. That's a good connection. That's it. We're able to get people scheduled for test, um, you know, as soon as possible, um, but we will be reaching out to more staff for additional help. But it's important to acknowledge these people. These are people who are doing this on top of their regular jobs, um, and they've all been wonderful and so great and helpful. We are in rough waters. Um, you know, we are the sailboat that's swimming along and we're trying to get to shore. And the shore is the end game of the semester. We have to take everything as it comes. Um, but as much as that monstrous wave is breathing down our neck, we have a plan to move forward for this semester. And I think that's so important. We're taking everything day by day and adjusting as it comes and trying to stay calm and try to make sense of this to everyone. So again, we're all rowing in the same direction. Again, I wanna emphasize this is a community effort. So everyone here is really helping and trying to reach that goal of academic continuance for our students, um, being able to um, meet the needs of new enrollment for the spring semester, but also keep our community safe. So in sometimes those can be competing interests, but Mark and I try to rein that in and make decisions that are gonna put us in a position that we're not struggling for a moment, that we're not closing out on things, and that students can still see and get the needs that they um, uh, require to complete the semester. So what does it mean 
today. I want to emphasize the word today in this. What does it mean moving to orange today? That means that all on-campus students and staff must be tested. So we don't need results, but they need to be tested prior to Thanksgiving. This was already happening with students. Um, I know Dan Kaufman and Tracy Cleveland have been working um, quite feverishly with our unions to get this in place. Um, so we thank them for their effort and support. I know this is a lot to go through in a short period of time. But what that means is that we have to get everyone tested, which they can do through our current pool testing or can be done through individual testing. Classes can continue at this point. So we're, again, very different than K through 12, as, as Bill mentioned. Um, and that's because we're testing more of the population than those schools would be. So keep in mind, they're doing that 25%. We're doing 100% here. So that's not only helping the college, that's helping our community. Um, classes can continue. And anybody who doesn't really need to be here prior to Thanksgiving probably shouldn't be and working remotely. So that's important when working with the departments to make arrangements for that. Um, but again, we, were, we are doing testing, all three campuses. Um, so this is um, a huge community effort that everyone's available and we have the supplies and we have the staff to do this at this point. So what this means moving forward for the fall 2020 semester, we need to have a lot of discussions in the next 24 hours essentially on what classes still need to maintain a face-to-face -face modality and cannot move to remote, determine what those classes are um, and what services need to be on campus to support students who are still in programs. And from there, we'll create a testing schedule the week of November 30th. So all campus will have to be virtual the week of November 30th. We will conduct testing during that time, bringing people in for scheduled pool testing. And as long as they have a negative test result, they'll be able to come back onto campus. This includes students, staff, faculty, to complete those courses the week of December 7th. So again, this doesn't change anything for students. This is back, SUNY gave us this mandate in September to do all of this testing. Students who are on campus face-to-face -face have been um, continuously testing bi-weekly through pool testing, as well as these pushes before Thanksgiving and the end of the semester. So it's not a huge change and a heavy lift for our students, but it is a difference for our staff. Um, we're really trying to limit the footprint. As you know, numbers are not good in Erie County. So we want to limit the amount of exposures as much as possible. Testing will continue throughout the remainder of the semester. Um, and again, we've been working and we're in constant contact with Upstate Medical, who is our supplier of the tests, as well as running the test results. Um, we contact them quite frequently <clears throat> with questions, but they also supply us with supplies in a, in a pretty timely manner. The advantage we do have is the fact that we are continuing face-to-face, -face, some limited face-to-face -face classes after Thanksgiving. Not many other SUNY schools are, but the good part about that is that that will reduce the amount of tests going to the testing lab at SUNY Upstate. Um, we have made the request into SUNY that we uh, do get prioritized given the uh, dire situation with the, the rates in our area. So um, I believe that they're receptive to that. They've been great. Um, we have them on speed dial. So we know where to find them, in other words. Amy, so, I have a question. I'm absolutely. sorry. No problem. Um, how are we able to still continue in in face to face? So after we talk Thanksgiving. Absolutely. So we talk with the chancellor, um, and keep in mind this is we have to look at it from a bigger picture perspective. So the the information that we're seeing out of the news is specifically for the K through 12 schools. So what we did is when we provided our reopening plan in July, stating that we were going to continue face-to-face -face instruction for classes that needed to after Thanksgiving, it was approved because we're still doing all of the, you know, large safety protocols, testing components, and everything else. So I think some of the times that that gets skewed because announcements go out and it's all education needs to be remote or this needs to happen or there was a press conference, I'll be honest with you, that um, the governor did state all SUNY schools will be remote. He wasn't accurate. And we're not the only ones, by the way. There's about, I think, 10 schools in, in the SUNY system that are also continuing classes as well. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Mm -hmm. So I do want to push out the pool testing number is 2704679. Again, this is staffed by our awesome team of volunteers. Um, you do need to schedule your pool test ahead of time. You can't just drop in, um, but they'll work with you on that. Please be patient. 
Um, like I said, we had a lot of phone calls overnight. Understandably, we're doing the best we can to get more volunteers to help with this hotline number and return those calls in a timely fashion. So please call, leave a message, and someone will get back to you. Um, moving forward for the spring 2021 semester, we did receive um, information from SUNY on how to plan and, and properly anticipate any changes. Um, we're working on that response to SUNY. We need to get that back to them December 10th. Uh, Mark and I are working on that draft now. We'll get that into interim President Reuter, which I'm sure he'll share with that with the board. Um, the, the, I'm going to put my Dean of Students hat on now. <laughs> I love the fact that there's a lot of support for students in there, including mental health support, as well as uh, transparency on courses, how a course operates, is it synchronous, asynchronous, things that we need to better communicate out to students and have a lot more transparency with the courses and what the ex expectations for that class is. So that's part of that report, which is great. It's not just all COVID, which, you know, I know that's important and don't get me wrong, I'm living and breathing it right now, but our students are super important and the support of our students is very important as well. Just a reminder that any of our reopening plans, including the testing plans are all available on the website. Um, anybody can view them at any time. Those are all the approved plans that we have sent into SUNY. Contact tracing is super important. We have a great team of contact tracers. I think one thing to keep in mind is um, we have 10 certified contact tracers, including myself and Mark. Um, so, we are helping the community again as a whole, because as soon as we hear of a positive, be it a student or a staff member, um, we are doing the contact tracing in-house, um, determining who needs to receive a quarantine order and go home. And we're sharing that information immediately with the Department of Health, Erie County Department of Health, which is helping them out. They are behind. They're very, very inundated right now. So whatever we can do to help the community as a whole, we're doing that as well. So I, I'm a positive person. I try to look at things and say, okay, how does this look? The, the good part about this is as much as I know there's a lot of chaos, I know there's a lot of questions right now, we're still continuing the semester. And so that makes me happy. And as, as much as I want to pull my hair out sometimes and it's late nights and making decisions and lots of meetings and lots of talking heads and screens, we're working it through and we're doing it for the benefit of our students. So the one thing I will ask of everybody is to have compassion during this time. It is very confusing. There are so many things going on. There's uncertainty. I, I just had to, my son's upstairs and doing remote for the first time uh, this semester as well. So he's, he's changing and, and he's trying to figure it out. So I know everybody's struggling with that. I know we have a lot going on, but have compassion for other people. You don't know what they're going through at this time and have multiple plans because things could change at any moment as we know. So at that point, I'm going to hand this over to Mark. Thank you, Amy. Hey, Mark, before you start, yes, can sir. I just mention one thing? Just uh, sort of follow up with Denise's question. Amy answered it in, with respect that when SUNY puts out these uh, guidelines, it's for all 64 institutions. And the pre-Thanksgiving shutdown was really targeting trying to stop the spread of students that are in dorms and are going to go home. And so the guidelines they put out about trying to shut down prior to Thanksgiving was intended to address those institutions with dormitories. As I've often said, 92% of our students come from Erie County. We don't have that same situation, but SUNY is requiring us to follow that same guidelines. I've spoken to a couple of faculty members. Doug has done a great job with his academic leadership of trying to impress upon them to complete any face-to-face -face sooner than later. Don't wait till December because we don't know where we, we're gonna be even tomorrow. So we are trying uh, to expedite the face-to-face -face instruction as much as possible. But again, SUNY is looking at the 64 SUNY institutions, looking at the 64 SUNY institutions in very different geographic areas and we're part of that SUNY guidelines. And they have been very receptive to assisting us. Uh, even last night, uh, Mark and Amy were on a call with the deputy uh, chief of staff for the chancellor just going through the guidelines. Sorry, Mark. Uh, thank you. 
I want to thank uh, President uh, Ruder and Chairwoman Wilson for this opportunity. I kind of want to go through where we sit operationally. Uh, can you back that up, Amy? Thanks. These are the people that we talk to daily and in some cases hourly. Uh, Erie County Emergency Services, DPW, Department of Health. The first thing I would like to go over is we're kind of lucky here, the relationship we have with this county. Uh, I talk to my uh, contemporaries at the community colleges every two weeks. And just for example, the largest community college in the state, Suffolk County, gets zero support from their county in terms of PPE. You know, we are very lucky that we have those relationships. But these are the people that we talk to, the different commis commissioners, deputy commissioners, uh, coordinators. And these are the people that kind of give us the peak, that, that crystal ball look at what's coming next or what to expect next. If you would, Amy. We also talked to uh, Erie uh, Erie County Department of Health, uh, been working with the CIO, Michael Breeden. Um, we're trying to increase his contact tracers here. And of course, the warehouse supervisors and Deputy Commissioner Adolph. Amy? Next. Okay, so the county's been supporting us from day one. Uh, they've been supplying us with all our PPE, all our supplies and support. Uh, and even things for when we had the code blue uh, operation, storage facilities and assistance uh, for that operation. They increased that PPE support for SUNY pool testing and uh, Patty, Patty and Guzino actually came in and fit tested all our pool testers so they could equip us with N95 masks and that's no easy task. We're also assisting the county with drive through COVID testing at South Campus every Wednesday. Uh, that currently is done in the Southwest lot, the C lot, uh, the county has purchased very large, they call them Alaska tents, but they're very large heated and uh, utility supported tents. They also have the rapid testing site at South Campus uh, that operates in the old DMV office that works Monday through Friday. Uh, we're supporting them with that. And we have the contact tracing call center at City Campus. We're also looking to expand that. Currently they have four rooms uh, upstairs in the post building. I did meet with uh, CIO Breeden last week. We are looking at possibly expanding that to three more rooms. They, as Amy said, they're, they're a bit behind on contact tracing. You know, we truly are lucky. We have 10, they have 50. If we have 10 for a college and you have 50 for a county, you can imagine how much work they have to do. They are trying to expand that and we're trying to assist them. The next thing we have on our plate, and we've been talking about this for about two weeks, is we are going to be uh, a pod site. This is nothing new. I'm gonna put on my old job. Uh, I sit on the County Disaster Board as an emergency manager. Uh, Erie Community College has always been a pod site for a point of distribution in case you have a disaster, whether it be a weather disaster or a pandemic. So, the county has already started planning for what we're going to do with vaccines. Those logistical supplies started showing up yesterday. Now, I have to tell you, we don't have vaccines. We don't have, you know, perishable supplies on site. This is very early and in the stages. But South and North Campus are going to be points of distribution for vaccines when that comes available. I wish I could tell you when that is, but I can't. Um, the other thing in a... Again, the crystal ball, the county's kind of given us a peek at where they think this is going to go. We had a conference calling me, correct me if I'm wrong, but included the county epidemiologist Monday. You know, she's, she's a very smart young lady. She's kind of given us an idea where she thinks this is going to go. Um, and that's what we're preparing for. Next. Ah, uh, yes. So our... Our motto for this operation is Semper Gumby, always flexible. Um, we came up with that early on. We will get t-shirts made at some point so everybody can have that. It's a Marine Corps thing. You get done with a cruise or an operation, you make a t-shirt. So this will be Operation Sem Semper Gumby. And there is our contact information. Uh, anybody can get a hold of us 24 seven. And as our provost always says, and we are gonna make a video of this, keep your distance wear your mask, 
wash your hands, and as Amy loves to say, go Bills. Any questions, Madam Chairwoman or President Reuter? Anyone? Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much both for your hard work and um, dedication to just keeping all of us safe and just ha helping SUNY Erie lead this in the, um, in the county and be a gold standard. You really have outdone yourself. I will also volunteer if necessary to be um, a call operator. I did some of that work in my college days and I'm, I can do it in the evening if you need me to. So put me on a list. But um, you said that the county epi epidemiologist kind of gave you a snapshot of what's to come. And I'm wondering if you're able to share that with us. No. Not yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. I, I, would, I would say be patient. Be patient. Yeah, easier said than done as usual. Yeah. Can I just ask how um, how this is going to affect year uh, semester and testing of exams? Not te so when you were saying testing, I was getting confused. I'm thinking of exams <laughs> for some of it. So, um, is 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 there any change in that? Are we all equipped to do that online? Is there any you know lab work? That I'll, I'll let Amy answer that. That's more in her wheelhouse. Sure, definitely. Um, we're having um, the academic deans are reaching out to their faculty now who are teaching any face-to-face -face courses um, to evaluate what needs they have still on campus. Um, if they truly need to be on campus to conduct a, a final exam or a final lab, um, we're going to work with them. We'll get them tested that week of November 30th um, and then move them forward from there so that they're able to come onto campus. Um, again, students, we are already planning this for because this came out in, in September. It's really just um, additionally with the staff. Thank you. Sure. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the community and the community numbers. Our pool testing numbers, and I'm knocking on wood uh, with both hands, to date, we've tested 2,011 students and we've had seven positives from our pool testing. So our rate is 0.35%. So when you're hearing seven and eight, nine percent, our pool testing is less than one half of 1%. Uh, again, it's we had four positives in the pool last week. I think we had gone three or four weeks prior with no positives. So it, it is out there. But I think everyone at the college, students, staff, faculty, administrators, everyone is is taking the necessary precautions <clears throat> and taking this uh, situation very, very seriously. But we will do all the pool testing. We have about 1,300 students on campus. And even if they come on campus for one class, they have to be tested before Thanksgiving. And if they have one class after Thanksgiving, they have to be tested again. And I, I applaud the efforts of all the unions. I know Andy Sacco and the faculty was probably, if not the first, but uh, very close to the first unit of New York State United Teachers, NYSET, in the state that stepped up and uh, signed a, an agreement for mandatory testing for his uh, members. And there was an article, I think, in yesterday's paper or the day before, the chancellor saying that there, he's not getting cooperation from NYSET. So not only did our local NYSET step up, Andy and his leadership, uh, but I forwarded that MOU to SUNY system administration so they could try to replicate it throughout the system. I think we should also recognize the students and faculty and um, administration who are coming on campus, but being mindful not to come when they're sick or not feeling well and to contain any infections that, um, that may spread. I think uh, they have all done a great job in keeping themselves and, um, their, and others safe. So I wanna thank all the staff, faculty and students who um, are required to come to school. And if I could just say one thing, uh, Amy introduced herself. Uh, 
Mark is, you know, Amy was not hired to be the COVID-19 co-task force member. Mark Petrolik was not hired to do that uh, position either. And he's actually interim. When uh, Tracy Gass left, Mark uh, became interim for uh, public safety and has done an outstanding job. The problem is Mark is uh, based at city campus and Mark has a key to the office. And when I see Mark coming into my office, it's primarily not a good thing. I like Mark, but it usually means that there's a problem. And uh, they, we have worked very, very well together throughout this uh, process. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amy and Mark. I know you guys have a 10 o'clock meeting. Uh, keep us informed. You know there's lots of questions based upon the communication. And Paul Sandy did a great job making sure that it says what it needs to say. And hopefully it answers as many questions as possible. But we blitzed it to every student and staff member uh, last night. They got the communication. Thank you so great. much for the time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. With that being said, our next order of business is to um, approve the consent agenda. I would like a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, are there is, any discussions? Just a reminder to the group that the two cell phone uh, cell tower leases that are items eight and nine were the subject of some discussion among the trustees about 10 months ago in January. They came forward. We looked at that. We asked Penny Howard about how the uh, contracted amount was established. We looked at the revenue stream. We blessed it back then. As I understand it, President Reuter, this is brought forward to us now simply to reaffirm the judgment that we made back in January that we approved these leases. Uh, yes, uh, um, Trustee Stone, I'm, we're now on the board approval items. I think that what uh, Chair, Madam Chairwoman yeah. was the consent agenda. Yeah. So, so we're, not we're almost there, Jeff. <laughs> Ahead a little bit. Yes, I, I have no discussion on the two consent items. Okay. Any other questions, comments regarding the Board of uh, Trustees minutes of October 29th? Thank you, Kelly and Kate, for those, or the talent management agenda. Um, I do have a question regarding the talent management agenda, and I don't know. Um, Hmm. I'm, let me just see. It's regarding step increases. So should that be discussed in executive session? And it's a minor question. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, it's, it's, can I just uh, ask I, it and you can just tell me? Sure. Okay. So uh, there was a, a step increase that went from an 11 to a 13. And I'm wondering, is there a 12 or... Is there a reason it goes from 11 to 13? So for the faculty contract, I think that's what you may be referring mm -hmm. to. A faculty member starts as a job grade nine instructor, goes to a job grade 11 assistant professor through rank advancement, goes through to associate professor, job grade 13 okay. via rank advancement. And then finally, the upper position for a teaching faculty is a full professor, job grade 14. And it's within the contract what drives those rank advancements. It's, it's time served, experience plus uh, evaluation. So it's all embedded in the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, thank you. I just didn't know if I missed You're a welcome. step. Okay, thanks for the clarification. With that being said, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I think we did that. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Can I just ask, are, are we on the um, lease agreements now? <laughs> yes. Now we're moving to the 
board of uh, board of trustee, trustees item received outside committee meetings. There are nine um, items. These are all. The board needs to approve each one of these. We can take them each separately and improve them each separately, or we can, you know, discuss them and then uh, approve them collectively. What is the will of the board? I have a question about the item, not eight, but okay. Shall we so, go to that? Okay. Um, so before you do that, let me, uh, uh, Trustee Stone. Do you, was your questions answered regarding this? Yes, I was just remembering okay. that we, these seemed familiar and we did look back and, and we talked about the, them in, in our January meeting. And I think okay. the, the concept here was to bring them forward because they, they were looking for a more fresh board approval of the same items. But Penny Howard, when she was here, did talk to us about both of these contracts I don't remember a great deal of controversy. I think I asked about how the uh, co the amount of uh, the contractual rate was set. Uh, I know it's a large revenue stream, but have we used all of our leverage to get the most money from these leases that we could? And I think Penny answered the question to my satisfaction and to ours back in January, I believe, because we all voted to approve it then. And now they're just looking for us to refresh our approval, as I recall everything. Okay. If I could add a little uh, additional information, Trustee Stone is absolutely correct. The board did previously approve uh, the item that appears on page 37, AT&T lease back in January of 20. The term does not end, I believe, until August 31st of 21. The county requested the college not to move forward with this uh, because they didn't want to get be asking for an extension uh, almost two years ahead of time. So we are asked the county if it's okay to move this forward. They said yes, but was uh, requested to have the board reaffirm. But you have previously approved the item that starts on page 37, which is the AT&T cell tower lease, the third amendment. The uh, last cell tower that starts on page 39, the Verizon, that does not change any terms and conditions. It's only they're updating some equipment and that's a, that does not get approved by the legislature. That's just a Department of Public Works has to sign off on it. And that is standard that any cell provider can change out their equipment as long as they're not impacting the signal of the other providers on that tower. At South Campus, we have three providers. We have Sprint, we have T-Mobile and AT&T. And at North Campus, we have Verizon total revenues per year from the four cell tower leases, we generate about $129,000 as of today. I believe the AT&T was renegotiated. Um, the marketplace is changing for cell towers. It's becoming more competitive. Some are building their own equipment changes, technology upgrades. So I think I don't I don't know what went through the presentation back in January, but I believe that was probably the reason why the price was negotiated downwards, but it's still a very good revenue stream. As far as maintaining the cell towers, the, the providers have to maintain any utilities that are used like electricity, we bill back to the providers, their pro rata share. So there's really zero cost for the college, but we do accrue the revenues from the cell towers. So, so my question is on page 38, the third whereas, and you're saying that Erie County is not wanting us to lock in to any long term. Is that what I heard you say, Bill? No, they asked us to reaffirm because we were roughly uh, eight or uh, almost 20 months ahead of the when the lease was expiring. And the county did not want to move forward to the legislature. It's something that was 20 months in advance of expiring. So that's why they asked us to hold off. And now we're less than a year before the expiration of the original lease. But this is talking about an automatic renewal for two years through August of 2036. That seems to me like a long way away with all the changing going on in this industry. So that's the only question I have is how prudent is that? And if you're telling me the county has signed off, I, I heard something that I thought was you were saying was different, that they didn't want us to be 
so far ahead. This seems to me to be really far ahead. We're going to be automatically renewing. Kate, I think we have a termination right. Uh, I, 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 I want to check this, but and I will as, as others are speaking, but uh, I think I had that same question. And okay. it is either party can terminate uh, before those five years, but they kick in if you don't terminate. It's okay. the concept of automatic. That Thank is you. true. That's why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Just play one on TV. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other questions um, regarding any of the items listed for board approval? I would uh, make a motion that we approve them uh, together. Second. Okay, motion approved. Um, I'd like to make a motion to. Can we take the vote on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, approved. Okay. It, Madam Chairwoman, can I just mm -hmm. make a couple of comments on a few of the items that you just approved? It, it will not change what you approve, but just to provide a little context. I think for the last three months, you've seen the academic calendar on the okay. agenda. <laughs> it's... Uh, this change was necessitated by um, the SUNY requiring us essentially to cancel spring break. Again, they're looking at the four-year institutions and four-year institutions have a spring break. We actually have in our academic calendar a uh, February break and an April break. And they made it very clear we cannot have those breaks. They want mm -hmm. us to go through and teach out and be done early. So. The faculty and the college worked together on modifying the academic calendar to support the SUNY directive. We still have one day in uh, this, the February break for President's Day and one day uh, during the April break for Easter or Good Friday. And this could very well change again. I don't know that you'll see it next month, but it could very well change because we have graduation day moved up uh, by two weeks. At, that is, and we've discussed it with the faculty, potentially we may have to adjust that if we are completely shut down and we have to extend the semester for additional face-to-face. -face. So they work very well with us. I was going to ask for a friendly amendment to the academic calendar because just yesterday we became aware of another change that was necessitated and that's the day for students to officially dropped from a course from April 2nd to April 5th. So on page 20 of the red line version, you'll see that April 2nd, April 2nd is actually the day we are closed. So we are asking for an April 5th. So I would ask you to consider amending what you approved. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, actually two items. We sort of passed over page 26, which is an agreement that uh, the college entered into with Damon. When I got back here, the Damon president, um, the Dye president, uh, several of the area presidents, Trocare has reached out to re-engage in conversations about partnerships. Damon and ECC had had some discussions about a dual admissions program. So I had the initial, uh, meeting with the uh, president Olson and then we uh, Doug and I participated in a meeting with their provost and we entered into this two plus two plus one program and what's unique although Doug will say that we have similar programs the what's unique about this it it's a provides a student that applies to Damon they're not automatically if they don't uh, get accepted they don't just get a rejection letter They'll get a, a uh, correspondent saying that they're admitted as an associate student is as long as they attend SUNY Erie Community College and complete the two years of the program. And while that's important by itself, it also provides those students that are enrolled as an associate student attending SUNY Erie 
that they can actually live on campus at Damon and participate in all the activities that Damon has and use all the services. So I think it's a win-win. A it's a little win-win. I think it's a little outside our norm of the traditional articulation and uh, agreement, but I think it's, it's a model that can be sustained and replicated amongst other four-year institutions. Doug, I don't know, you have anything to share about it? Uh, no, we've had uh, a, a, an agreement with Damon for uh, veterans and international explicitly that I think um, expired. So this is uh, a sort of a renewal, but an expansion of that, as you've mentioned. Uh, we have an existing agreement with Buff State, uh, which is called the Cat to Bangle program, which is specifically the dual admission. Um, and we have are in conversations with several other um, uh, um, common transfer organizations, basically taking our existing transfer articulation agreements and re redescribing them as dual admission with possibly additional benefits to the students and uh, the benefit to the college being that we can now talk about these things as a, under a large umbrella and the students can be thinking about being admitted to their intended destination uh, four-year institution right from the start. Um, those other discussions with other campuses I don't know if they've got a, I don't know, pandemic or something going on, but every once in a while, our conversations get interrupted. But uh, those are ongoing, but also I have the several agreements that we, we do have in existence, literally on my desk, so that we can adapt that uh, language instead of starting from scratch. So I think this is a real opportunity for our students as well as um, our college, but I'll stop there. And then one other thing I'd like to mention, if you, uh, page 34, I know it's not a huge item, but the uh, college actually applied for a $10,000 a grant through the Pepsi Company Recycling Zero Impact Fund. And we were awarded, this happened well before I was even around, but we were awarded $10,000 to fund a student bus shelter that is environmentally, environmentally uh, friendly we actually will have grass and um, flowers on top of the bus shelter at North Campus. It will be generated through solar. And it's a, uh, it's a wonderful project that we're getting involved in. And hopefully we can replicate something similar at our other campuses to, to really demonstrate our commitment to um, energy and energy efficiency and, and the impact on our environment. So I just, I want to give a shout out. I came through uh, Shannon Reno, uh, Assistant Project Coordinator of Student Transportation who works uh, with Katrina. So I, I applaud those type of efforts that they're thinking outside the box and bringing some, some positive to the college. Hey, Bill, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was, I wanted to congratulate Shannon too, before we moved on. That was a very cool project. $10,000 that we would not have had. And as my son-in-law is a farmer, I know he appreciates pollinators. So it was good to see that. <laughs> I, I, I too wanted to congratulate Shannon. Um, that just brought light to this entire packet. Reading a 139 page packet is kind of tough. And that being right in the middle, just, just really made me smile. So I can't wait to see how that comes out. And absolutely, it could be replicated throughout. So that's great. I also want to say um, to to Doug and um, Bill regarding the the Damon um, the Damon articulation agreement that I think that's a great idea. I as a Damon alum, I. <laughs> 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 Just throw that out there. No, but I, I think it's a great way to, to offer an opportunity to students who may have a hard time getting into a private institution. And if I'm not mistaken, they are charged our rate, right? Yes. The, during the, the associate's program. Years, correct. So half of that um, that cost is supplemented or, you know, extremely discounted. Uh, through this program. And I think that's just a great opportunity. And I hope that um, this, along with the other articulation agreements, the uh, Cats to Bengals program and things like that are um, 
publicized. So, you know, us common folk can share it and get people interested and let them know that it's, um, it's available. So thank you very much. Okay, so given that we do have an amendment, even though it's a small one, I think we do need to um, just call again the um, of the vote for the slate of items received. But this is an amendment to the calendar bill. Yes. Yes. Item number one, page nineteen. Yeah, I'll move it. Move the amendment. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, hearing none. Items is items are approved. Okay. Um, um committee briefings. Um Vice Chair Jeff Stone for the budget audit. Good morning, everyone. And Good morning. Th thanks for the briefing uh, earlier on the COVID situation. That was very helpful as we all were watching the news yesterday. We last met as a full board on October 29th, Thursday, three weeks ago. So it hasn't been very long since we had a meeting of the full board, this whole group together. Uh, since that time, we, we did not have an interim budget committee meeting. Um, and we are now moving into a committee of the whole mode starting in December. So there's nothing new to report by way of a meeting that took place since our last board meeting. Uh, but we have had an election, so that was significant. Uh, when that gets sorted out and officially confirmed and, and verified and moving forward, we will see the fate of what I've always talked about at the beginning of all my reports, which is federal relief for the states and localities and municipalities and through them to our college. Uh, I am sort of out of the business of predicting about that because I made a prediction last May that we'd have it by May 15th and I was terribly wrong. So I, I hang my head a little bit over that, but I did expect that at the time. Uh, I do hope that we will have some sort of federal relief and even um, just for the recollection of the group, even the, the offer from the Senate did contain $500 million in relief for states and localities and municipalities and through them to colleges and schools. So that money is out there. Obviously with every day, the political calculus changes, the election occurred, the Senate hangs in the balance with the Georgia runoffs and so forth. But we will see, we will just have to see. At this point, I would say um, the odds of getting something in the next couple of weeks, month, even two months might be slim. Uh, but maybe the odds have improved of getting something in early 2021. Uh, we'll just have to see. Um, and of course, that informs uh, President Reuter's reports, his dashboards, the information that we get. Right now, it's pretty bleak. Uh, we'll hear about from him about enrollment, which is holding roughly where it was about three weeks ago. And uh, the state aid picture is still very unclear. We don't have that money. Um, we'll be talking about this at the Committee of the Whole. Um, very painful and very difficult and very uncertain for all of us. So I don't think I have any remarks really beyond that, other than to ask President Reuter to talk about either now or when he makes his report later in the meeting. Uh, the, the dashboards that are referred to in our materials, pages 41 and 43, that will give us a good um, update on enrollment exactly and exactly what's happening on the financial front. Last month, we heard about chargebacks. That was interesting, and I'm glad we did that. But uh, there isn't a lot new. We the Just so the group knows, the Board of Trustees has been focused in the last several weeks on uh, making a selection of a search firm to help us in the search for a uh, new president for the college. And we have made good strides in that area and we will soon be uh, knowing exactly whom we've picked for that job to help us. We've, we've got that, this will be reported on later in the meeting, but that's been the focus in the last couple of weeks and not too much new on the financial front other than what we'll hear from President Reuter either now or later in the meeting. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jeff. And I, I'll make some uh, remarks. I'll save enrollment for under the president's report. But page 41 is the operating account as of October 31st, two months into the fiscal year. 
And then on page 43, we have a financial report as of August 31st. As Kate emailed me at 10 to 9 this morning as I was preparing, the dashboard on page 42 and 44 are the same. Uh, the PDF that was copied from the Excel copied the wrong dashboard, and that is my fault. So Bob is going to actually bring up the dashboard that should be on page 44. That is just a picture of where we, at this point in time, finished last year. With Jeff's remarks, there is still a lot of unknowns with the, the federal and state government. 1920 has not been closed out as of yet because of some of these unknowns. And we're trying to transition all financial data out of colleague and actually do the close in workday. So we are expecting the auditors to start their audit in December, but we're trying to get everything in workday. As far as some of the unknowns, we still only received 80% of our fourth quarter 1920 payment. So that's about a $1.5 million shortfall from what was originally budgeted. And then right now, 2021, we're looking at about a $5.7 million impact of that 20% reduction in state aid. Again, that could all change depending upon any stimulus funds that are directed to state and local governments. In addition to that 20% reduction in base aid or delay, I should uh, call it, we are seeing a 20% delay in our TAP. We get about $12 million in state funds through HESC and we're looking at a 20% reduction right now. Along with those unknowns is some dynamics having to do with the CARES Act funding. As you know, we received two allocations for CARES Act, uh, $3.9 million directed towards students, and then $4.3 million in institutional care funds. Early on, we were um, told that that $4.3 million could be used for offsetting any cost of going from in-person to online academic instruction. That is the state guidance, while the federal guidance is much more restrictive than that. So there's still some debate between the federal and state guidance of how much we can utilize from that institutional allocation that we could recognize in 1920 and or how much we can recognize in 2021. The other sort of new dynamic that just came about yesterday is some discussion that you can only use your Institutional Cares Act funds to the level that you've spent down your student cares funds. And we still have about $1.2 million of student cares funds remaining. I know our financial aid director is on a call this afternoon to see if there's a little more flexibility to extend that uh, drawdown until the spring. But right now, the information we're getting is there may be some in, um, limitations on the CARES Act for the institutional portion. The other thing we continue to do is we continue to track any FEMA eligible reimbursements. We have, as of Wednesday, Amy, in addition to her COVID-19 role, she actually completes the form and sends it to SUNY. So as of yesterday, we have $1.86 million of eligible FEMA reimbursable expenses. Have no idea how much of any of that will be reimbursed, but we have filed the application for FEMA. So we are in line with certainly both hands out, but we there's just so many unknowns still with uh, the finances caused by the COVID-19. I know the board has supported some early retirement incentives. And we also went through a, a situation Jeff, where so we, before we before we go oh, into yeah. retirement, can I just ask those those care monies have to be spent by December thirty first, right? The cares institutional has extended until March of twenty one. Originally, student has to be dispersed by the end of this semester and possibly even earlier. That's why we're seeing if there's a little wiggle room for the institutional, for the student portion to extend. So it's the same date as the institutional portion. Our challenge, Kate, most colleges were able to spend down that institutional portion because of student housing. Without student housing, that 
big nut was not there to send out. So we are being very aggressive. I reached out to our financial aid director, Scott Welchin, this morning and asked him if we can get our, uh, deans of students involved in getting that information out even more to students as far as the eligibility for those funds. So it's two different dates right now that has to be spent down. And uh, so speaking about you know, what we're trying to do in the interim, we did an early retirement center past August. We went through some layoffs and uh, a few uh, terminations. And then we have another early retirement center for the current semester. As of yesterday, we had 22 individuals that are participating, 11 teaching, 11 faculty, total salary and benefits estimated uh, savings for a full year of $2,378,000. So in total, we're looking at, uh, through the three actions, over $8 million of salary and benefit savings. I've been starting to track on a biweekly basis what our payroll spend, just salaries, and for the first five payrolls of fiscal year 2021 compared to last fiscal year, our spend is down 1,221,000. That's five pay periods. We have 26 pay periods per year. When you add benefits, we're looking at about a $1.8 million decrease in what we're spending on salary and benefits. So we are trying to take care of the expense side of the ledger as much as possible. Uh, we can't control a lot on the revenue side, but we are trying to make sure that our expense spending is down as low as possible. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions. Again, during the interim president's report, I'll talk about uh, some other items, especially enrollment, but if there's any questions on uh, the fiscal reports, I'd be more than happy to address them. Just one question regarding the care student portion. We had to initiate notice to the students that they qualify for this, this yes. uh, these dollars. How was that yes. done? Uh, direct communication, email, text, telephone calls, put it on our website. So we did as much as possible. Again, just this morning, I asked uh, our financial aid director, Scott Welchin, if a dean of student or dean of students can be involved in the conference call today because, you know, they come from with a different lens. Maybe they have some creative way to get those monies out to students that need. Uh, we, it's, there's certain guidelines that we have to follow, but we're, we're going to try to be as creative as possible within those guidelines to make sure the students receive all the funds that are available to them. Okay. I'm just thinking, um, because I mean, especially during these times, it is so difficult for many of our students, many of everybody. And, but if, if we can ensure that we do not leave it on the table and that it goes to, to them in good use, that would be, I mean, that's our goal. I, I know you sent a lot of communication. I would just say, uh, you know, a full court press at this time so they can, they can have what they need. Yeah, the, the problem, I mean, there's lots of ways we could use it. Uh, for the students, but we cannot, we cannot take the funds directly like, you know, for tuition assistance or scholarship mm -hmm. or uh, a laptop or, mm -hmm. or whatever. It has to go to the students, but then there's mm -hmm. no assurance. You know, we're saying here money is for a laptop. There's no assurance in that the students are in fact going to buy a laptop with the, the funds. So there's yeah. some checks and balances that we're still needing to do but again we're trying to be as creative as possible madam chairwoman so there... if the student didn't buy a laptop then what what happens like how do we have to report that out so i may say you may give it to me i may not buy a laptop but i might buy groceries you know for a month what can i not do that that would not be an eligible expense no okay i'm not but is there sure a way... by the i'm sorry Go ahead. I was just going to say, is there a way to do vouchers or something with a local computer company that we could, you know, have a little more control over checks and balances that could ensure that they get them in the hands of students? Clearly, the digital divide is a real problem for our students. I think the language is it has to be 
provided directly to the students. I, what I'm saying, or maybe some kind of discount program if they use it there. I, but I hear what you're saying. It's hard to control. We are how trying it's spent. to be as creative as possible. I got gotcha. you. I'm sure you are. And Thank if, you for doing that. If we get any additional information, I think the call, the conference calls at two o'clock today. If I get any kind of clarification or additional information, I'll certainly get that out to the board of trustees. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Jeff, as well, for your report. Next is Secretary and Chair Kate Massiello with Policy and Governance. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, our committee met um, on October 14th. You have the minutes in the board packet from that meeting. We also met on November 10th. Um, had a robust discussion about um, strategic planning and um, some other potential policies, but none are in the uh, in shape enough to bring to the board at this point. Our hope is that um, they will be at the next board meeting in December. Um, and I would invite all of um, our trustees and anybody else who would like to come to our next meeting of the Policy and Governance Committee, which is at four o'clock on December 2nd. That's my report. Thank you. Uh, next, we have strategic planning with assessment. Um, excuse me, strategic planning and assessment. Trustee Halbler. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we had a, a meeting uh, last week, uh, November 12th, attended by the uh, full uh, board. And uh, Fabio uh, did a, a really comprehensive uh, uh, review of the history of uh, uh, our current strategic plan, your Excel, how we got the, here, uh, where we're at in terms of uh, the, the programs and initiatives uh, under the strategic plan. And we had uh, a, a discussion about extending uh, that plan uh, until a uh, uh, new uh, president is, is hired and uh, there's a resolution to that effect um uh, with some um, amendments that I I would uh, or other caveats that I I would uh, uh, defer to uh, Fabio to to describe and introduce the uh, the uh, resolution certainly thank you uh, the resolution um, accomplishes uh, two things uh, first it establishes uh, a one-year extension of the current strategic plan um, set to expire in August of 2021 right now. We're seeking the extension in order to um, allow us to continue on the current plan in order to allow the new president once appointed to weigh in on those conversations. Um, we just didn't want to uh, build a plan absent a permanent president, um, and that's the chief reason for that recommendation. The second uh, plank of the resolution uh, authorizes uh, the uh, staff uh, through the interim president to make changes at the goal and initiative level only to the plan. Uh, what this would accomplish is give staff flexibility uh, to continue to pursue the current targets, but doing so with uh, renewed projects or initiatives and or goals. The, um, the check that we would institute in order to ensure that we weren't straying from the um, spirit of Excels is to have a monthly report out to the board on all such changes. And that would um, go through strategic planning and assessment as well, and um, could be included as a report out to the board. Those are the two uh, significant changes in the um, strategic plan. We are currently working on recommendations to goals and initiatives um, with the um, senior executive staff, and those will be considered at the next SPA meeting as well. Whether you approve that extension um, and or approve the additional flexibility we're requesting um, we would uh, be prepared in December to um, to either report out on the changes or to request changes on the plan. And that will include both 
um, some closing out of current uh, initiatives, as well as um, some new initiatives that would carry us through the next two years. I'll, um, I'll end by just summarizing roughly where we've been. Uh, we created the plan in 2016. We uh, underwent a significant revision in 2018, and this would be the second significant revision and carry us forward to the last two years of the plan. Um, the one kind of change that we're not making this time around is any changes to our targets, at least not at the current uh, moment. Uh, and so this is a more minor revision than what the board approved in 2018, uh, but we still think that um, making the changes at the plan, uh, excuse me, at the goal and initiative level is very important and um, also hopefully allows for a good reporting infrastructure for the board uh, and also appropriate flexibility for staff. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, right. We had a, a, a very uh, a good discussion about the, the resolution. There were amendments made, as Fabio alluded to, and uh, I think uh, it uh, has the support of, of the board. So I would uh, uh, make a, a motion uh, in, in favor of, uh, of, the, um, of the resolution. And, uh, and then after we get a second, we can have some more discussion. I'll second it, Ted. A second. Is your microphone on? On the resolution, can I just say that the third whereas we need to say targets, and then in the second and third resolved, it should at the, you know, it should end with, and be it further, just for technical reasons. With yeah, that, could, I'd could offer you, that amendment. Did you say the second where from the last whereas clause? It was missing, like uh, runs through. Right, the se second and third both should say, and be it further. Be it further resolved. Yeah. And both the second and third resolved. And the third, whereas, should say targets. Right. Very good. Any op uh, opposition to accepting a f that friendly amendment? <laughs> it's offered that way. Okay. Thank second. you. Thank I'll move that amendment. Second. Okay. All in favor? There you go. Aye. 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 Great. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, for curriculum student success and diversity, uh, Dr. Schwartz and myself. Susan, you want to take this? I sh you're, you're on mute, Susan. I don't know if you're able to talk, but I should note that our minutes from the October 13th meeting are not included in this packet, but will be included in the December packet. We did not meet um, this November, but we'll be participating um, as with all other committees in the Committee of the Whole in December. I just want to make two highlights of that October meeting, which... Um, we may have briefly talked about in our October board meeting that we are going over our board, excuse me, our student orientation. Uh, there will be one, um, a revamp for this fall and also an official revamp um, for, no, excuse me, one this spring for this upcoming spring and then an official revamp for this upcoming fall. So look forward to that. I also, and I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but um, uh, in respect to diversity, uh, equity and inclusion plan, reached out to both Tracy Archie and Tracy Cleveland to um, get more information on the plan. So in our next meeting, we'll be discussing, um, well, at the Committee of the Whole, we'll be discussing the uh, targets and goals from that, from the plan that we currently have and see, um, where we are and how far we have to go. And that's all I have to report. Thanks, Denise. I finally got through. Okay. <laughs> so, I do you want to add anything, Susan? No, I was just wondering if Doug wanted to say something. That's all. Uh, no, thank you. That was a good summary. Thank you, Denise. Okay. Perfect. 
Thank you. Um, okay, so the report of the chair, and I will uh, keep my, my report brief. First of all, again, just want to thank everyone um, for just pushing through these very challenging times. I know, um, especially for the SDS staff, you guys have been asked a lot of questions and have been uh, put, um, just had to deal with a lot of transition and a lot of shifts. And um, I just want to thank you for, for your work through that. I also want to thank the, uh, the deans and all faculty and staff for all of their work in this. I know I personally have been um, working with all of you or most of you um, and through, through the different committee levels and such. And I'm just grateful for the information that you have and that you continue to provide. So thank you for that. Also want to thank uh, interim president Ruder for, I mean, just his level of excellence, uh, ex expectation of excellence, as well as um, increased transparency and knowledge that it has been so helpful for to me um, coming on. And so I'm ex extremely grateful to uh, you, Bill, and um, thank, thank you. you for your leadership. So what I've done, um, I attended the New York, New York Community College Trustees Association group. Pardon me if I got the, the acronym wrong, NYCCP. And <laughs> it was uh, at their, their um, fall meeting, which is a two-day conference. We normally go to Saratoga, which I miss because I love Saratoga shopping. But um, <laughs> we were able to we were able to meet via Zoom and it was great to hear from all of the board uh, chairs and uh, board members from across the state. And um, just also knowing that we are all sharing similar experiences as we try to navigate through these uncertain times, that was really helpful. This uh, session was focused on divers diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is why my email to Tracy uh, both Tracy's came out, I think it was Saturday morning. You guys are probably like, well, what is she talking about? So <laughs> I just have to send them as it comes. You don't have to respond until, you know, Monday. But um, so that's that those conversations were very um, encouraging. And also just to know that the SUNY community college system collectively moving together um, in this mission to become more culturally responsive. It was very promising. Um, we talked a lot about just the future of SUNY area. We, uh, Johanna uh, Duncan Portier joined us and presented as well, just to give us a, as much as insight as she could. But Bill always, it sounds almost as if I'm talking to, listening to the same person because he gives almost very similar reports. We are, you know, there, there's so many uh, uncertain times, um, uncertainties ahead, and um, we just have to just do the best that we can in our individual roles to, you know, to move this college forward and to uplift the students who are struggling. Just remember, you know, they are having a hard time getting through this, just as we are. And as decisions are trickling down, you have to know that ultimately it's the students who are being impacted, good or bad. So just be mindful of that. And um, I think that's where, oh, the search committee, uh, we have done so much work on selecting a search firm for the upcoming, the upcoming presidential search firm. And so we will have conversation today, discussions, with, um, in the executive session, and we will select a search firm today. So with that being said, um, that's the end of my report. Okay. Oh, Thank I you, still have to navigate the meeting, huh? Okay, wait a <laughs> second. <laughs> All right. So um, for our ad hoc committee reports, um, uh, immediate past chair Linehan, Yes, um, Denise, the marketing committee has not met. Um, we'll make plans for a new schedule for the new year, but uh, we have not met in the last couple of months and we will okay. um, we'll get that back uh, fired up as we get into the new year. 
then maybe we can include them into the committee of the whole. And then sure. that way, you know, yeah, I'll it'll let just fall right in. Yeah, awesome. Um, technology, Chair Carrie Phillips. Hi, everybody. Uh, we did have a meeting scheduled last week. Unfortunately, it got canceled sort of at the last minute for um, an illness. So we did not meet. Um, our agenda was ready. And I don't know if we should be again in the committee of the whole or if mm -hmm. we should reschedule our meeting individually. Um, I'm thinking that the committee of the whole, at least for December, would be appropriate. Okay. Um, we, we talked about talent management. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else, Susan, that you would like to add to talent management? No, there's nothing new on that one either. Thank you. Okay. And I gave a quick update with the presidential search in my report, but I just want um, everyone, uh, as far as SES, who leads the their individual, uh, their respective committees, to we want to coordinate the agenda items for the com December committee of the whole meeting, so there's not duplicates I, and redundancies. I know, you know, as from sitting in several different committees, you report on. Um, middle states in a few, you report on, you know, uh, ret uh, enrollment and retention in a few. So let's coordinate those agenda items so that they fall, are reported out in a respective committee. And I think, Trustee Stone, a lot of it will come to you first. Um, okay. So with that being said, the report from the interim president. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I will ask Bob to pull up some enrollment information. We have a few updated charts as of this morning. The first, by location, please. The first is our first look at uh, spring enrollment. We are only two days into reporting for spring. And even before I discuss spring, I do want to mention uh, last meeting we talked about our final fall numbers being down 16.5% headcount and 17% FTEs. But since those numbers, we have done that return to complete program. We started three classes. We had 60 student headcount in those three classes and 180 credits and uh, six full-time equivalent gets us a little closer to budget. We don't make budget yet, but I, I'm highlighting it because it's a, an initiative that really came through the faculty. Uh, they've been trying to start something like this. It's not only generating additional enrollment, but it's also allowing students that may have fallen below full-time to allow them to their financial aid. So I, I applaud the efforts of the group of faculty that really took the lead on this. And we certainly support the administration, the SES certainly support uh, new and additional initiatives. And I think you're, we're starting to see, and I'll mention a little more about the, uh, the information we're getting out for winter and spring enrollment. We have all, all facets of the college involved in the enrollment process. So. The numbers for spring, again, second day. Uh, hopefully this certainly changes dramatically, but the numbers are tracking uh, lower than last year after the second day of spring registration. Our schedule just got online. There's a lot of unknowns for our faculty, a lot of unknowns for us as students. No one knows what the academic delivery will be. We are making it very clear how we are going to be delivering classes, but as I said many times before, many of our students have families and the, there's a great unknown. You're hearing school districts now shutting down completely. So we're going to work very hard. I have some initiatives that we're moving forward for spring, but if you want to go to the next slide, uh, Bob, I think it should be winter. So this is a snapshot of winter, the last four years, how many classes we ran, how many sections we ran, our uh, head count, and then our enrollment count, and then the FTEs. 
So we are trying to make a big push to get uh, students into our winter classes. That way we're trying to hit our last year's numbers and or improve on last year's numbers. Again, this is early in the enrollment cycle for winter and we have some initiatives that we're doing. And then I believe you have one more, Bob. Funnel, yes. Uh, and you know, we talk a lot about the funnel. Funnel, the, the information that comes on this report comes via Workday. The previous two reports is enrollment information kept in colleague. Ideally, at the end of the day, at sometime in the spring, those two reports will be the same. But this funnel really talks about sort of pre-enrollment, where we are. The trends as far as inquiries is down from last year. Applications are up, which is, which is a very positive trend. Admitted is a little short of where we were last year, but we are doing a number of things for spring. Um, again, with the faculty's help, the faculty are uh, messaging in Blackboard, informing their students of not only the winter enrollment process as well as the spring process. We're sending out a second round of email blasts and text messages. I think they're going out this Friday and Monday to push advisement and registration to all our students. After Thanksgiving, uh, we'll start doing a postcard mailing. And we're also working on those students that were at in school last spring had not completed, chose for some reason to not enroll this fall. We have a, a list of about a thousand students and we are focusing efforts to try to get some of those students back. We have about 200 that we are uh, starting to triage and identify what the issues, what the barriers were, why they did not continue their studies in the fall. So we're helping, we're hoping those numbers uh, pick up. Counselors have stepped up. They're now part of the enrollment team meetings that meet every Friday and they're reaching out to students. They're really targeting the students that are struggling with the online delivery mode and they are trying to connect those students with a faculty advisor for registration. So they're helping them in the current semester, but also paving the path to get them to register for spring. So we're doing a lot of different efforts for both uh, this, this spring, but also winter. Uh, I've heard Doug mention several times that it's a lot easier keeping those students if we get to them before Thanksgiving break, especially if we're trying to move as much remote as possible. So the next week is very important for us to build our spring enrollment. So those are just some talking points. I, I think the, the bottom line I would like to you know leave the board with as far as enrollment, it's, it's not Doug and Fabio and Bill that's going to drive enrollment for the institution. It's the three of us, but it's everybody else at this institution. It's the faculty in the classrooms. They're with the students on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the advisors, it's the counselors, it's the admissions uh, offices, it's registration. So people are really stepping up and I applaud everyone's efforts. No idea is a bad idea. Some are a little more costly than others, but no idea is a bad idea. And I, I think you're, we're getting a sense of uh, a lot more or enhanced cooperation from all facets of the college, which I certainly greatly appreciate. Any questions on the enrollment? Then I will quickly turn, we talked uh, as far as the agenda, the revenue and expense report, but I can, I'll just shift to the foundation. I've sent this out to the board members uh, December 9th. You have six documents, three, two of three of which are the same. So you have a clean version and a red line version of a significant change to our current operating agreement between EC, SUNY Erie and the ECC Foundation. As you know, historically, the college has supported all the personnel within the foundation. Last year, I think the amount that was recognized as far as the audit for the foundation was $211,000. And that did not even account for the full salary of the executive director it was only a a portion of that salary. 
early on in my tenure back at SUNY Erie, I start, started having discussions with the chair of the foundation, Mark Gollin, who is not, an, he, he wanted to take the foundation to a new level. And we started talking about how SUNY Erie could facilitate that, taking the foundation to the next level. And we started talking about the staffing and having somebody in that position as executive director, having two masters minimally, the foundation as well as the college, costs at times some um, maybe inefficiencies. So we talked about how we could change our current um, agreement modeled after some very successful foundations like Monroe County Community College. And what you have in front of you is a, a document that essentially the foundation will hire an executive director and they've taken on an assistant coordinator position that was a college funded, both of those positions. They have taken both those positions. The college in the first year will provide $10,000 per month to offset some of those salaries and benefits. And it will be evaluated on an annual basis as part of the budget process with a plus or minus percent that it cannot go up or down by more than a certain percentage. The agreement has, is not, there's not a lot of significant changes. There was some dialogue with the foundation uh, president, board president, about the uh, college president having voting rights as a board member. We talked about that during the retreat. I made uh, the red line version offered some changes where they are a non-voting member. And then there was a couple other changes having to do with conflicts of interest disclosure that the prior version required foundation board members to provide the college president that they thought that, that was problematic for the foundation board. I did in fact go through the corrective action plan that uh, we have and I want to make sure that any of the changes are not in conflict uh, with the corrective action plan that actually is included in your agenda a little later, but I did not see any conflict to the proposed changes. I reached out to Paul Amon, who is sort of filling in as a pseudo executive director and Mark Gollin earlier this week and Mark informed me that their search for executive director, they actually got 18 resumes of excellent candidates. They've uh, shortlisted that down to five. As of Tuesday, I believe they had done two of the five interviews and we're hoping to conclude the interviews for the executive director by the end of this week with a start date sometime in December. And, you know, um, oh, I, I want to uh, quote, one of Mark's comments, he said, the foundation is very excited about the next chapter of the ECC Foundation. So they are certainly, uh, I think, re-energized by this proposal. You know, we uh, talked about it at the board level. Paul Lamana, you're on the call. Is there anything you would like to share from the pseudo executive director's role that you're serving right now <laughs> and or as a foundation board member? And you're on mute, Paul. Yeah, go. I just I just turned it off. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you, Bill, essentially, and the board for working with us. I think that uh, when we say we're in a new day, we really are. I mean, I can date back three years when this changed over, and both Tom Bacon, who's no longer on the board, and Mark and I and a few others who decided to stay um, were waiting for this change to happen. And I think because of Bill's coming in and because of you guys on the board, we are moving to a new day. We've already started with the selection of the, the director. We'll have someone that will report right to the direct, right to the uh, executive council. Uh, I'm still on that board and I'm on the executive council. And I'm kind of, uh, I would call it shepherding the association along for the last uh, three or four months. We've done an awful lot of things in those three or four months to move it forward. So when we do get the new director, we have a strategic plan for that person. We have some goals and objectives for that person. And that person will have to be reporting to us directly, which is great. Um, I will say that the, the constitution of the new board is exemplary. We added some new people um, to the board that have filled some slots we needed. We needed an accountant. We have that person on now. I stepped out of the treasurer's job, moved into the vice chair's position 
and we brought in uh, 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 Jeff Kincaid, Jay Kincaid, who is now going to our treasurer and a uh, fully certified accountant. He, uh, right off the bat, we ended up with $12,000 from the PPE, which he applied for. So that helped out a bunch. Um, in the interim, um, we're, we're, the office is now being streamlined so that uh, each person has their own responsibilities and in, in, in fact, will report to the foundation, so to speak. We like the fact that we will be our own house, so to speak. We are under your auspices, but we are in our house, and we know the students come first. Um, we, our scholarship committee has been working very hard. We already have awarded our fall scholarships, and we're going to be working on the spring coming up fairly quickly. We've met with all our large donors. Well, I actually met with all our large donors to make sure that they're still in the fold. We're beginning communications to all our alumni and all the people that are correct we have correct addresses for and that in itself, just finding the correct people is really an immense job. Um, and my other hat that was, will be extended is just ending, ending. I just ended up rolling over our graduates from this past year. I'm not sure anybody really knows that we have about 84,000 people that have gone through this college and actually got degrees, uh, stating back to when. That's a lot of bodies. And as Bill has pointed out, I'm not sure that's true in the 92%, but um, last four or five years, most of those students stay in Erie County and contribute to uh, the betterment of our county and the betterment of our students. So we're going to start reaching out to them and have them work with us, hope for the betterment of our students in the college as a whole. I'm not sure I can add much. Um, I know Mark and uh, Tom and I, and Tom's not on the board any longer, work diligently, and I, we like the changes to the, to the um, new bylaws. And I think uh, we want to be independent. We want to be able to move forward and report back and say, hey, this is what we have done. Uh, although we do need your cooperation and do like your contributions too. So um, whatever you can do to help us out, which helps all of us out, we'd appreciate it. I think that's about it, but I have all a list of all kinds of things we've done, but I don't need to go into that. So thanks. Thank you, Paul. I have a question or two. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for their hard work on this. I know it's been years in the making, and um, we are in a new place, and it's really encouraging to see. So I commend you on all your hard work. Um, in reading this, I had a question. They were it was it talked about um, sharing of non personal customer information so that we cannot share, um, and one of those is social security numbers, and that raised the question for me as for a risk management purpose, we do not share um, social security numbers and we really don't use them very often, do we? Like I remember when I went to college on my ID was my social security number. Right. right. I know that's changed since then, but I want to make sure we're not, you know, sharing that information with the foundation and that kind of thing. Just no, to answer your question, no, we are not. And actually uh, we just signed an agreement again under my tenure. I went after this to try to insulate the college and ourselves. We actually have a, a separate um, insurance policy that we picked up for the um, association just to make sure. We know we're covered by the broad spectrum of the college. We wanted someone inside. So we oh, actually have we signed up for the other insurance policy through our right. auditors right. and uh, that's protecting us as well. But we know we do not share social security numbers. We are under the same FERPA guidelines that the college is under. Good. And um, as a former director of registration, <laughs> I know very well how <laughs> difficult and how important that is, as I answered a lot of FERPA questions. So okay. um, I will continue working with the new director until such time as that person feels comfortable and um, kind of looking over the top. Well, we're grateful for your oversight, Paul, because nobody knows the ins and outs better than you do. I just have a couple other questions, which as Bill noted, kind of relate to the cap issue that we're talking about later. And these all relate to the ECC Foundation. First, um, our cap item on one, page 115 requires our board to approve receipt of any gift um, of real property. And as we know from last meeting, we approved a policy that allows all gifts to go through the ECC Foundation. So I'm wondering if we need to you know, codify that somehow when we discuss the cap. I'm raising this now because it relates to the foundation. We, can, we don't have to talk about it. The next thing is the bylaws for the um, ECC Foundation, um, 
the cap agreement on page 117 requires that all of our affiliated entry entities um, do not um, have a board that's comprised of people um, who are related to the college. You know, that independent, they're supposed to be independent. And I wonder if your bylaws, Paul and Susan, I know you're on the board there too, um, specifically say that persons who are affiliated with the college, employees, students are doing business with either the college or the affiliated entity are not allowed to be on the foundation board. I don't believe, I don't believe and I don't know if it needs to, I, I'm just raising this because, and, and I know you've done a lot of work in this and I don't want to throw hot, you know, a wet blanket on what you've done because it's been great. But I just, since we're looking at cap items that relate to all of this, it would be, it makes sense to me to attack it all at once. Well, I know it wasn't part of, um, we had uh, Jay take a look at um, uh, some of the laws that um, apply to college foundations. And uh, from what he researched back when, this is probably, I don't know, maybe six months or a year ago, there was nothing specific that stated that there had to be that division, okay? Right. So I don't know, we, put, we didn't put anything in, at least I don't recall us putting in anything in the bylaws to address that, although we have kind of adhered to it anyway. I mean, this is just, you know, direction from the controller and our decision, the board passed a policy that required any affiliated entity to include a requirement that a majority of their, so it's a majority of their entities are not um, oh, I see. comprised of independent members. So I just think that should probably be codified somewhere and it's your business to do that, but I don't know how else, you know, we're adopting a policy, but we at least need to let you know what it is. And if we haven't done that, Bill, can we make sure that we send that over to um, the foundation? The next, okay. um, Kate, can you send? Kate, can you send that over to me? Yeah, I think Bill will use make sure that happens. Thank you, and Bill. You know, send me a copy as well. We'll take a look at it. Sure. And then on page one thirty seven, again, a cap item. It requires the ECC Foundation um, to provide the board with an annual statement of its goals and objectives, with associated specific metrics the coming year and its activities for the immediate preceding year. Is that included in this agreement? Uh, I'm not sure that's included in the agreement. Our strategic plan, though, has that involved in it. I think you got a copy of that. Um, but we can always add that. I don't see that as a it's, problem. I don't know that it has to be in the agreement as long as it's provided to us. That's what this says. Oh, yeah. So I just, matter of fact, but I don't know if it should be. So that's, I'm just raising it. Like As a matter of fact, I think uh, I'm going to be uh, sending to Bill over to Bill today for the, meet, the uh, board as a whole meeting, I guess, uh, the new concept. Um, what we're going to be reporting to the Board of Trustees on, on a regular basis. And I think that was my item number three, uh, was goals and objectives on a yearly basis. So yes. that'll be part of our, that'll be part of, might not be in the bylaws, but it'll be part of what we report. As well as because we that's three. the last cap item that relates to the board on page 139. So it's required that we get these kinds of reports yeah, about your key activities you will, you will, and contextual will have that. And Kate, we have been getting that and Paul, uh, through the budget and audit committee, I do recall regular uh, reports on the goals and the progress toward the goals. Well, in fact, at the last meeting, yeah, Paul, last I, I suggest <laughs> that we use the ECC foundation report as a guide for our own strategic plan because it was so specific. So I think you're doing a great job. I just didn't know if we needed to codify it in the agreement. So I just raised the question and it took us a little while to put that strategic plan together. I, mean, I would think was, so. Three of us took, took a long time, and then I, I, I tweaked it a bunch of times. Then it, then it kind of laid and sat there for a little while while we were in this negotiations with Dana, and then we brought it back up, updated it, and you have it now. So. Um, That's all my comments. Can I just add something? Up? I just want to, again, commend Paul for stepping up uh, after retiring from the college, coming back full Full gear as a as a volunteer and and playing a role and help to revitalize this foundation. I think this new plan is going to go a long way towards giving us the you know the energy, the new momentum, the the juice we need to really uh, take this foundation to a new level. So I just want to thank you, Paul, and everybody who is you know and the foundation members for uh, particularly Mark um, for for really revitalizing this 
foundation. I think it's going to really be, be good for the school as we go down the road. Thanks, so, thank you. Thanks, Len. Um, I really don't know if I'm in retirement yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, uh, Kate, you brought up four items, page 115, 117, 137, and 139. Yes. I, um, I don't know what the board's pleasure, if they want to approve this or wait until December. I think 115 is really something that could be handled through the actual form. And I know we have to change the form because there's a reference that, uh, so we could probably handle that through the policy committee mm -hmm. all the other items are have been done i did not change anything that in the red line version from the previous version so we've been operating under the previous version in the items that would be addressed as part of 117 137 139 to jeff's point and i reached out to paul and sue holdaway either tuesday or wednesday getting ready for the committee of the whole so I know what's scheduled there on as far as the items that are required either on a monthly, quarterly, or an annual basis from the related entity. So I'm on that right now. Jeff and I had a conversation about the budget and audit committee uh, yesterday afternoon, and I let him know that I'm doing all that as well, trying to make sure it's every month we know what's going to be on the agendas for the various areas of the college. So we're not scrambling around to Denise's point, trying to figure out what should go on there. And and I think, you know, I, I mean, it's great that we're working so closely together and, you know, I don't want to stop progress on this um, agreement. I just, um, you know, if we can keep track because we're required to do so, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be included in the agreement as long as somebody's keeping track of it, Bill. And so we want to make sure that when you are no longer in that chair, that you have a plan to, Pass along the yes. requirements Absolutely. to the next person. Absolutely. All right. Thank and you very much. Be the place. So I'm not sure, Madam Chairwoman, if you would uh, entertain a motion to approve the amended agreement with the foundation. And we will make sure that we're covered on anything and everything with the cap uh, for not only the foundation, uh, as well as the ASC, as well as the college. And at Kate's request, that is why the corrective action plan is included in the board package. And before, can, can I just clarify with Paul? Um, so we are required, the board, our board, the board of trustees to approve receipt of any gift. And we are about to, you know, the, now all those gifts go through the foundation. So your board is not gonna have any problem with us having to kind of rubber stamp your because um, I know you're going to go through all the due diligence to make sure that it's, you know, in good shape and in good condition. And, I think, in, and I think in, uh, Kate, I think in all aspects, we would work with the board 100 percent. And anything that's a large gift, any any gift that's a major gift would be worked through the president's office. Uh, we're talking right now with some larger foundations about assisting the college in, in our efforts to get the students more aid, et cetera, et cetera. So. Those kinds of things will be coming through the college for sure. Uh, you know, the West Her thing and um, yeah. some of those other things. Absolutely. I think those gifts of real property can get sticky. I mean, you got to get an appraisal and everything. So I'm just trying to figure out or, or yeah. suggest that we get a streamlined process so that our approval of this, which is required by our cap item, doesn't hold you up. So that's my only point in raising yeah, we, we might want to discuss that a little bit more, uh, Jeff, and how we'd want to make that work through, you know, the committee of the whole you know, in terms of the, the dollars and cents. I think that's important. All right, um, so thank you for indulging me. <laughs> no indulgence necessary. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I wanted to get just one other comment. Uh, we have a board meeting, uh, an executive council meeting next week, week after, I think, and then our board meeting, we want to get this adopted so that we can move forward with right. a new direct director with a, um, everybody agreed bylaws and agreement. So we'd appreciate if we could move this forward. I have no objection. So I'm sorry, so Denise, see. I interrupted no. you. Were you calling no, for a No, that's vote? okay. Yeah, we, we have a motion on the table now. So, Bill, the motion, the motion is to accept the... Uh, uh, 
Page 83, the foundation operating agreement. Operating page agreement. 93, foundation bylaws. And page 109, foundation exhibits B, C, and D. Do I have a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your hard work as well. I appreciate it. Thanks. And I don't know. I know a lot of retired people. You guys seem to work much <laughs> more. <than this. laughs> I, you make me wonder what this retirement is supposed to look like. <laughs> this is this is the new retirement, Denise. It's not I the old see. retirement. You squeeze in golf whenever you don't have a meeting. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, can I thank the board for moving this forward so that uh, we can move the association forward? Um, we, I can't say how excited we are about this. We've been on this for a couple of three years, you know, and, um, you know, my heart's with this, this college and so is the new board. I think we have a number of people there that really want to move this place forward. And, uh, Bill has been a tremendous help in getting this moving. Uh, Mark's been great. He was one of my students. We used to play basketball together back in the old days when I still could move around. So, so he's been a good leader as well. So we're, we're looking forward to working with uh, the colleagues, the board, and, and helping our students, which is really the goal we're in. Thank you awesome. again for it. I'm going to jump off. If you have no other questions, I have an 11 o'clock staff meeting. So, <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Happy you go, Thanksgiving. Paul, before you Happy Thanksgiving, Paul, everybody. I'll see you in December. Uh, Thanksgiving. Wait, Paul. All right, thank Paul, you. Before you jump off, yeah. I, I, yeah. I want to say something about the relationship between the college and the foundation, and it's, it's not – Bill Ruder, it's not Paul Lamont, it's the, the partnership. That's so important. Just this week, there's probably four different items involving the foundation and the college through Paul's association with Tom Baker, who used to be on the board. Now he does the investment uh, for the foundation. He got me a meeting with Blythe Merrill of the right. Oshai Foundation. And then Blythe and I had a conversation. And yesterday uh, morning, Blythe... Rob Joyer, myself, and Tom Baker had a conversation about how Oshai Foundation may be able to help the college uh, in some areas. Tuesday or Monday, we had a photo op. Uh, Patrick Lee Foundation, strong supporter of some of our academic programs. They actually came on campus, Jane McGavro, the executive director of the Patrick Lee Foundation, to take pictures with our, some of our student awardees. And then I know I'm doing a day of giving video shoot this afternoon for the foundation as a fundraiser. And uh, Sunday, I think it was, or early Monday, I emailed Mark and Paul. I'm watching the Bills game. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Josh Allen went to a community college. Is there an opportunity for us to reach out to Josh Allen? His notoriety with the Oshai uh, Children's Hospital as well as just the community embracing him, if we could somehow get him to be part of the SUNY Erie family as a community college that's basically in the backyard of where he plays. So those are, I think we've really started the traction that this will be sustained for many, many years to come. So I, I see it as a very positive and powerful uh, relationship. Uh, if I can uh, piggyback that for just, thank, thanks Bill for doing that. Uh, we have an awful lot of great people that we can contact. Um, we had a meeting. I had a meeting with Jane from the Lee Foundation. I, I set it aside. I happened to hear her when we were doing our scholarships that Pat said, you know, we might be interested in giving some more money. So we jumped right on that. We had a private meeting with her. We're, we're going to be getting into a new contract. She's going to, in January, we're meeting with her again. They're going to try to raise the level from $5,000 to $6,000 per student. They give us around $50,000 now. We're going to open up more, more curriculums with them so they're not just the ones we have there. We're going to bring in dental hygiene. We're going to bring in some of the other ones. No. Uh, with, with Josh, uh, last year, actually, I mentioned the bill. I have, I have a real good friend with the bills. <clears throat> and I asked him if there was something we could do with, you know, with Josh because it kind of the same thing. And he contacted me to contact. He says, why don't you wait till he's here a little while? Well, so I forgot all about it. Then Bill reminded me the other day. So I, I have a phone call into him too, to see if there's some way to man, maneuver that as well. Um, 
there's a lot going on, you know, and uh, our big, our, we're trying to cultivate our larger donors so that they will become even larger donors. One aside, before this meeting this morning, I had a, uh, a half an hour conversation with one of our 1975 graduates. He happened to be the photographer in the yearbook when the Eagles concert was here, and I was the advisor. <laughs> and we met, we met through uh, some, I don't know, something came up, and uh, next thing you know, I'm talking to him, and we're talking about doing scholarships. So uh, those are the kinds of contacts that all of us have. So um, we're going to try to maneuver that. And, and it's exciting. I can only say it's exciting. And we're even doing this, doing this COVID thing, as you guys are done. It's not as easy. You know, it'd be much easier to have lunch and talk about it and to do it at Zoom instead, you know. So hopefully this will change and we can get down to some of the other stuff. But thank you again. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Madam Chair, I just have a few other quick updates. And then actually, is, is does the board, Kate, I know you've been asking probably every month since I got back about the corrective action plan. What What is your, and I shouldn't say yours, but what is the board's appetite? What, what do you want to do with this information? Is it? I think it was just intended to remind the board of what our obligations are as a result of the um, audit that the state controller did and our response to how we were going to operate and, and you know, to correct some of the actions that they recommended we take. Um, the ones that I raised earlier related to the foundation were ones I, I thought we needed to look at. They should probably also be looked at as we're working on contract with a ASC. Um, the thing that jumped out to me this time is the one on page 116, where we um, said we were going to be conducting annual training for new and current board members. That includes a review of the trustees policy uh, manual, the budget accreditation requirements and laws regulations at the federal, state and local level. So I think when we met at our retreat, we um, addressed some of these items, but you know, I, I'm not sure, Carrie, if you feel like you've had an annual training. I know Susan was working on a rather robust orientation um, for new trustees, and I believe that applies to the student trustee. So, you know, this kind of annual review of the CAP recommendations that we approved, um, it's just a check-in to see if we're, in fact, on track to be you know, to, to be doing what we said we were going to do. So that that was my intention to raise this. Kate, I, I appreciate you doing that. I, I read that and I said, oh, these are, these are you know, I had not laid eyes on those things. And uh, adding myself to, to Carrie, I, I, I never really had an orientation either. Um, so when I saw that recommendation, I thought, hmm, we're not really doing this. So I was glad to see those. And maybe to clarify and confirm both for myself and others on the call, perhaps, this is has nothing to do with middle states or our accreditation. This is coming from an audit by the Office of the State Comptroller that gave us specific findings and, and, and we agreed to certain corrective steps. And so the idea now is to keep those steps in our mind and in front of us and actually do them and not just let them be a report that collects dust. Okay. So I, I'm fully endorsing that. And I think we should have an orientation for new trustees, um, including me. <laughs> I've been yeah. around 18 months. So I think, Len, weren't you working on that with Susan? I know Dennis was, but I'm not sure if you picked up with that effort. Susan, perhaps you want to speak to the orientation? Yeah, we, we did get, I did put a, a letter to uh, make sure that we had everything that we needed to provide the people that are going to be joined here. And so um, we had them the opportunity to meet everybody in the departments and um, make sure that they understood what their roles and responsibilities were. Um, and unfortunately, we never got through the whole thing, but that was the whole idea is that they had an opportunity to travel through the, th the three departments or the three areas, and then to be able to um, have an opportunity to engage them and answer their questions. Um, I, I thought about this too. Um, we have a new student trustee coming on every summer, basically spring. 
And we could key this orientation to that event. And then any trustee who joined in the since the last time or any trustee who just wants a refresher could be involved. And I, I was thinking of things along the lines of, I mean, I know COVID has made it difficult for me to do this and I want to, but touring each campus, maybe getting a day or a morning where we right. just get on a bus and go right. around and take a look at Northland and go in there. And, you know, I, I've done some of these things in a sort of uh, catch as catch can way. I went to a reception at Northwood. I've been to all the campuses and so forth, but, and it comes kind of by osmosis if we don't do it this way, but I think it would be right. more efficient for us to do this. And I bet most of the trustees would join up for that every year just to be refreshed right. and talk again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and one of the problems I will acknowledge is that we have two vacancies and they, these vacancies are getting filled on a very haphazard basis. I would be much happier if we had a full 10 person board as we should. Um, that has been taken over by events and slowness and some political quarters and whatnot. But we have eight trustees. That's eight out of 10. I wish we had 10. And we never quite know when those other two seats will be filled or when we have a vacancy, we've got some holdovers. The whole thing with the board, I think, could be tightened, and it, but it's difficult because it's not within our college's ability to do that. It's outside right. political actors get involved, and I don't have a solution for that other than to say, let's work with the eight that we have, and let's get as much orientation done for those eight as we can so that we can be a better board. And that was the intention of this. Um, I never received an orientation either, although I did make a tour um, of all the different campuses and had, you know, by now have figured out a lot, but still there's a lot I don't know. And um, in, I, I'm raising this because it's something we should do. I recognize that, you know, we have so much on our plate right now and this is an aspirational goal thing and we need to keep it not necessarily top of mind, but on the to-do list, if you will. And, you know, it would be helpful if maybe Fabio, as you're thinking about strategic planning, you know, what are the main things that board members need to know about different departments and, you know, as, as a way of summarizing where, you know, the basic things that, that new incoming uh, board members need to understand. And I think, you know, a good basis is the retreat we had in that um, discussion that I missed, but um, was from the state about the state funding and how it affects SUNY how, and how SUNY money affects um, ECC, uh, the community, where are we? <laughs> <SUNY> <laughs> area. So I just, I mean, that we have some materials that we can put together as a rough yeah, package. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you know, where this belongs, um, maybe because policy has already said we are going to have this, you know, annual training, so we've passed that. So we, you know, how it gets implemented is now the question. And that's again, why I brought up these cap items because just making this an annual check-in on a board, at a board meeting, it doesn't have to be this time of year. It could be any time of year, perhaps in the spring when we have new student trustee come on, but you know, a good time to kind of orient all of us at the same point that these are the things we need to be looking at on a regular basis and, you know, kind of just codifying it. Yeah, I think for the home for that will be strategic planning. Um, I think that what we should do is to move forward is Susan, um, if you can let us know what we have. And yeah. I, 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 re I remember it being on the platform. So we have our own platform with some of this information. And then Bill, you can help from your view as well as to just give us an uh, outline um, of the the important information is all trustees must know. You you can probably help us help us with that too. Sure. And then from that we can plug in, you know, key things. As far as um, I know, I never received the orient. I don't think anyone <laughs> received the official <laughs> orientation. <laughs> but I do remember taking a day uh, to do a tour of the the campuses and. Um, I think it is really helpful. There is so mm -hmm. much, and I, it really takes a long time to get just, you know, just to know what it is. So I think um, we'll start there with, we'll house it in strategic planning. So we'll add this to the strategic, excuse me, my cough drop. We'll add this to the strategic planning agenda to be reviewed. Um, well, now that we're going to solidify the orientation, let's 
let's make it a working item. And then after we get it solidified and implemented, then we have yearly reviews of it. How about that? Yeah, and without, so, I like it without getting too far down in the weeds. I, I would say that this day should look like a like this or something like this. It, all of us getting together, being transported among the various sites that the colleges mm -hmm. runs mm -hmm. and then have a, at an assembly hall or something, uh, a place where we could hear for, say, 10 minutes, not even more necessarily from many of the people who are on this call this morning about the the, the function that they have within the college and what they're portfolio is and what they right. do. Again, we've picked up a lot of this through all the materials we get and that we read and that we have these meetings. So we're not ignorant of this, but it would be wonderful to hear, oh, I don't know, Susan, give 10 minutes to all of us on just let's, here's the story on ASC, Paul talking about the foundation, uh, uh, someone talking about security, enrollment, uh, admissions, just those big subunits of the college. I think if we, it wouldn't be long, I, we don't need a PowerPoint, but I think 10 minutes hearing from the head of those divisions, one after the other, would be awfully helpful. And I would suggest that while we're on the bus, we have the Dean of Students for whomever the campus is that we're going to be with us on the bus and talk to us while we're, you know, so we're not wasting time. We can get some oh. insight before we arrive there. And then, you know. Great idea. Yeah. Okay, so with COVID, I'm not sure how this is right. going to work. But that is an amazing idea, and I would love to have done. I, I would, I would love to figure this out. Um, so we have some type of board orientation packet, something that someone can receive once they become, once they join the board. They have time to just read through, and not just a packet of policies, a packet of bylaws, but we actually have like orientation where. We know what programs we have going on. We have financial information. We have strategic goals and initiatives and things like that. And then, so that goes home with the, the trustees where they can review, ask questions, what have you. And then we all have this also in-person orientation. Um, we just have to figure out how to do that with COVID. But, you know, it could be done. I mean, I mean, if right. we, we have... We, we rent a large enough, you know, bus or something, van, I don't know. And then um, go for, I mean, we can social, social, social distance, uh, socially distance. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. That way. So we can figure that out. And, and I think, Fabio, you, you know, the importance of governance and having the understanding of what that is. I'm sure Middle States has some documents on that. And I'm sure ACCT has articles that would be helpful to be in that initial packet that goes out to new board members. And maybe you should go to everybody just so we all have, you know, more paper. <laughs> but um, I, I did, so that, that was the point. I'm glad everybody's so receptive to this. Yeah. Um, and I think we could make this something really great and be a model yeah. for yeah. other community colleges throughout SUNY. It's, yeah. it's well right. overdue, never got through it, but we'll start it now. That's right. Awesome. No yeah. time like the present. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Susan, anything I can help with, please let me know. And then, yes. uh, Kate, to your point, when I'm gone and the next person and persons, I would suggest that the CAP is part of your annual meeting. So every year, you know, the annual meeting, that's a refresher of the corrective action plan. Thank you. That makes sense. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Bill, is that it for your report? Uh, just a couple quick updates. Okay. Um, ASC, I talked to Sue Holdaway uh, yesterday just to try to get a sense of the plans for the campuses for the spring. She has a board meeting with her in December. Right now, she's anticipating no food service at South. You do know the bookstore was closed down at South, no food service. Child care at all three campuses will be driven by uh, the enrollment and the city campus food service. Right now, it's basically being sustained. You heard Mark Petrolik mention earlier, we are hosting uh, the county contract contact tracers on our campus. And if they were not here, we'd probably not have food service at city campus either. 
And then North Campus, we're doing lunch only. We've talked about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know Chairwoman reached out to Tracy and Tracy, and I would suggest maybe that it's a um, something that we put for the board meeting in December. Just I, I'd like to go towards like presentations that we're going to be covering so much during the committee of the whole. I think it would be a good discussion as part of the board meeting. And also, um, Petrina reached out to me. Petrina uh, is at the Say Yes. They have their annual meet, uh, monthly meeting the same time as our monthly board meeting. So Petrina uh, goes, attends that for the college and for me. And Say Yes has developed a dashboard for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're trying to replicate something like the Say Yes dashboard for the college. And I know Petrina reached out to Tracy Archie yesterday or the day before. And I think we have a meeting scheduled, Tracy Archie, for next week, the three of us, to start developing that dashboard. And then Petrina let me know that uh, we had 47 faculty and staff that participated in a training offered uh, through the Pride Center of Buffalo. Looking, the, the title of the presentation was Cultural Competency Training and you know how we need to learn to be more inclusive a uh, more inclusive community. And Trina said great things about the training. Athletics, uh, nothing final yet. We were on a conference call of all the community college presidents earlier this week, and we agreed to make a decision by December 1st for winter, January 11th for spring. Um, we are all anticipating canceling any competition for high risk sports. And um, I spoke with Steve Mullen yesterday on this because he deals in a different network of athletic directors. And he said it's, it's somewhat unfair because what we're doing from a community college perspective, right down the street, um, he indicated that Brian Stratton already is in there into their basketball season. Mm -hmm. So, there's a lot of, you know, different ways of approaching it, but we're making sure that we're in lockstep with the two regions that encompass all 30 community colleges, as well as SUNY, as well as the County Health Department. So I will keep the board informed as we proceed, but no decisions have been finalized. The, from a facility update, we have several capital projects that are continuing the roof replacement of Bell Center at North Campus is uh, moving forward. We have some window and door replacement that's going on at Kittinger and ADA upgrades throughout the three campuses. Several projects we're just waiting for division of budget to approve, even though it's an approved capital budget, capital project. Division of budget from a cash flow standpoint is approving each individual project before we can start drawing down funds. So we have a couple of projects waiting for DOB approval. And just uh, yesterday, I finalized JMZ will be presenting at our December 4th Committee of the Whole, sort of a status where we are with the facility master plan, answer any questions, but offer some possible uh, paths to go moving forward for the facility master plan. We do have dollars left on the contract. Their contract right now has expired. So that will certainly be part of the conversation, but they will do a presentation. I said 45 minutes, but with q and I, I anticipate it will be an hour. I know Jeff and I spoke. They have not been on campus, have not presented to the board in quite some time. And a lot has changed since they were last year. So that is planned for the um, committee of the whole. We've had many, many, many meetings with the chancellor, the senior vice chancellor, I had a one on five meeting last on Veterans Day with senior officials uh, quizzing me on our reopening plan, our testing plan. And at that time I did mention about the MOU with the faculty and they were thrilled by that and asked me to send them a copy, which I did. I'm on a bi-weekly call with the West New York Regional Community College presidents, and it's great sounding board because some of us are in this same region that is going through these changing colors, but we're all facing 
similar challenges uh, with our wind down. And then, um, Denise, you mentioned the NYCCT. Similar NICAP is the New York State Association of Presidents. We had a, a call earlier this week. We're starting to talk about advocacy position for the next budget. I know one of the presidents uh, presented during NYCCT and the discussion on advocacy is nothing's happening right now because we don't know what's going on with the state, but there's the initial thoughts are centering on the theme of justice, equity, and opportunity uh, because of our role in the community. So, and that and that's very positive news. A couple of quick meetings. Um, had a chance to meet Adam Perry. Some of you may not know, but Adam Perry was a longtime trustee at the college. He's a uh, on the NFTA board. So we just talked about potential opportunities for partnering. I had a meeting with the Dottie Gallagher from the Buffalo Niagara Partnership and AJ Baines from the Amherst Chamber of Commerce and similar themes. What is our role in workforce development? Uh, so we are going to continue to have those discussions. Very positive. I had a meeting with SUNY trustee Eunice Lewin. I've tried to meet with her every month and a half or so just to sort of learn firsthand what's going on with SUNY, SUNY board, the chancellor, as well as anything that she is hearing in the community about SUNY Erie, things we need to pay attention to. And that those meetings have uh, you know, been very productive. It actually resulted in a couple of meetings we've had with an organization called Buffalo Construction Consultants. We hosted them at North Campus, and then uh, two weeks ago, we met with them at Northland about the potential of a construction and or civil technology program starting at Northland. And the other thing uh, Trustee Lewin was uh, very helpful in, I shared with her uh, some information regarding Duville trying to start an associate's degree program at Duville and she asked me for all the information that Doug had provided from our perspective, but Trocare College provided their information and Niagara County Community College. And she's uh, very interested in um, that issue. Last week we met with Dennis Elzenbach. He is um, set up a meeting with a company called Verardi Parati. Parati. It's on East Elvin. Uh, they make uh, battery systems and that will ultimately replace uh, engine, diesel engines. And again, the theme of us providing training for their workforce there. And I give my, you know, the academic side of the house is really stepping up to look at what kind of partnership opportunities. And then uh, my last meeting of substance and I thank you, Jeff, for reaching out to me on this. On uh, Tuesday of this week, we met with uh, Stravati Aerospace at North Campus. Uh, Bill Maravito from Niagara County Community College attended, and then the two principals within that company, John Simon and Bob Sugarman. Stravati is an aerospace company that is trying to acquire, is, has a footprint at Niagara Falls Air Force Base trying to acquire some additional property and they have plans to ramp up their employment significantly over the next several years and want to see how, again, SUNY Erie can deliver academic training for their employees as well as provide internships and co-ops. And the, the, the big takeaway I had from that meeting is Bill and I talked, Bill Marabito, the president from Niagara, <laughs> talking about instead of replicating the same program, what is our sweet spot at Erie? What is Niagara's sweet spot? And how we can come together and not offer the same program that both of us have, but really focus on our skills and our strengths to deliver great academic program. So he is trying to set up a meeting with our academic leadership, myself with his academic leadership and Shravati sometime at, up at Niagara County Community College. He came onto our campus at North Campus and Chef Wright provided salads for us. And I asked him to not to poison Bill Maravito's salad, uh, but we, we had a good laugh. And Bill, Bill is very 
uh, welcoming and very receptive to building a partnership and relationship with SUNY area as we go forward. So that's just a, a few items over this past month. If any questions? If not, Madam Chairwoman, that uh, concludes my interim president report. And I would just like to close my portion of the meeting uh, wishing each and every one of the trustees, our students, our staff, a, a warm and healthy and safe Thanksgiving uh, next week. And it's we're facing some tough challenges, all of us. And, um, you know, just just be safe and healthy and enjoy next Thanksgiving. Thank you, Bill. Um, You're welcome. Thank you for a very uh, comprehensive report, as well as just everything that you're doing out within the community to expand our, um, our services, our programs, and also to re repair our name in the community. I think that is going to go a long way. And so we appreciate that. Um, the student trustee report, Travis is currently taking exams. And so we had to release him to do that. <laughs> so he does not have a report and he will um, report uh, next month. College Senate report, Ms. Colleen. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope my dogs uh, jumping on the back window have been very entertaining for everyone. They really uh, have. I, and you, your dogs are huge, too. <laughs> they are. They're uh, Newfoundlands. Tracy Cleveland and I were at a meeting the other day, and she asked me if there was a bear uh, by my door. <laughs> they look like bears. <laughs> and now my dad is here wandering around, so excuse that. That's <laughs> Uh, but uh, we met uh, the day before Veterans Day, uh, wishing all of our uh, student and faculty and staff vets, uh, you know, a great day. And uh, to start our meeting, our very own Madam Chairwoman joined us to greet the College Senate as, you know, tradition as each uh, chairperson takes over. And uh, it was a very uplifting report. And as Bill uh, Ruder also mentioned that uh, Denise is a friend of education and a friend of the community college and a, one of our number one advocates. And I think it's always very important to remind, um, you know, the body of the college that although the trust board of trustees helps with the functioning of the college, they're also, you know, in it with us to uh, help the college. So that was very uplifting. So thank you for joining us. Um, and then, we also did not know who uh, had won the election at that point. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about the budget and any sort of uh, help that we're going to be getting. But one of the outcomes of the election that I personally enjoyed is that the uh, first lady elect is a community college professor. So I think that is going to be huge for us as an institution because we're going to have someone within the White House that has that community college perspective. And I think it'll get us a lot more uh, respect and uh, within the government and across the United States. Um, Amy and Mark, as they were also here for you guys today, presented uh, similar, but it was much different. We weren't even yellow at the last college Senate meeting, but uh, they have just been uh, very uh, straightforward with their communications and they're gonna be, um, standard uh, agenda items for the next couple of months, because as we all know, things have gone to zero, to yellow, to orange. Um, so we'll continue to get updates for that. So our next meeting is December 8th. So um, I encourage you to watch the meeting, especially uh, the beginning, because that's also where uh, interim president Ruder, Ruder gives enrollment and budget and Amy and Mark will also be giving COVID-19 updates. So I always tell people the first 20 minutes, not that the whole meeting isn't, but if you only have a little bit of time, the first 20 minutes gives you a pretty good chunk of the very important things that are going on right now, right at that time. Um, and as uh, we already know, the spring schedule is live. And uh, as interim president Ruder mentioned that we've had several uh, faculty initiatives to get 
the word out. We've had uh, letters crafted and they are now posted in Blackboard pages. Everyone has uh, announcements in Blackboard and some of us are also doing uh, extra credit. I'm, I'm doing extra credit. I get, I'm doing five points extra credit on my last test for anyone that sends me a screenshot of uh, their spring schedule or their graduation application if they are uh, graduating. So since I announced that at the Senate meeting, I've had several faculty reach out to me and say that they too are doing that. And if we combine those numbers, we have at least 22 students between us that are registered for uh, the spring semester. So, you know, as uh, we, uh, President Reuter uh, mentioned, we've only have two days of reporting on this. So every little bit, every little initiative. So hopefully those numbers will increase. Um, and then uh, this was already mentioned, but our project complete with the 60 students has had great success so far. We had a meeting on Tuesday with some of the instructors on how those students are uh, doing right now and uh, all the students are doing well. So that's very promising. There's only a few weeks left in the semester. So uh, things are looking really good for those numbers. And uh, our faculty groups are now looking for additional courses that we could possibly um, do in the spring based on the success of this program. Because right now we have a, a liberal arts, math, um, human interaction, and a, a social science course, all part of our SUNY Gen Eds. All students have to take courses within those areas. So we're looking at other courses that we can include in the springs to uh, make sure we help our students, which is our number one uh, priority. Um, and then with that, uh, we did talk, uh, we, I, it's me and, and my dogs in the background. Uh, we're at the COVID-19 meeting yesterday. Um, and the first one before we went to Orange, not the second one. Uh, but the first one we were discussing uh, different uh, efforts to support our faculty and staff and our students. So uh, Tracy Cleveland uh, reached out to myself and Marianne Partee, who is our Center for Professional Development uh, chairperson to provide different EAP opportunities for faculty and staff that are concerning uh, how to do the holidays under a uh, pandemic, right? There's all sorts of different stress along with that, as well as how to finish up a school semester with a holiday and a pandemic, all these different things that come in to play uh, in financial stress under the pandemic. pandemic. So uh, we shared that out with our faculty and then Marianne will also be sending out a communication with that next week. And I know talking to people, it's, you know, the stress of Thanksgiving is uh, one that's just not going away. And, you know, when I had the, the floor at the Senate meetings, I, uh, I shared. So I have uh, close to 50 people at my house every Thanksgiving because, uh, you know, I'm Irish and Catholic and there's a lot of us. <laughs> and <laughs> I know, like Kate, yep. So uh, I'm, we're just going to have my immediate family, just the six of us in this household and those two giant dogs. And it's, difficult, but we're going to do a Zoom meeting and, you know, it's worth it. And I keep seeing these things, you know, uh, these memes out there that uh, a Zoom Thanksgiving is better than an ICU Christmas and all of those different things are being intubated at Christmas. Um, so which that is what we do not want to happen. So, you know, we're all working together to make sure that everyone is safe. Uh, and then we also learned that uh, for our students, um, and uh, this was from our deans of students. They have Wednesday, Wednesday pause that was yesterday at 1215. And one of the main components of what they talked about yesterday were similar services that the faculty and staff have, but for students. Um, Cause that was also a faculty concern like, okay, like, but what are we doing with for the students? Is there a place for them to reach out that they can get assistance? So that was covered in the Wednesday, Wednesday pause yesterday but they will be sending out a communication to all of the students this week. And they're also going to include um, myself and Marianne Partee from our Center of Professional Development Office so that we can share with all the faculty and staff so that if we see a student um, in crisis or just stressed or in need of anything, we can pass along um, those services. Um, and then, with uh, just a few other things, uh, I know interim uh, President Bill Ruder already mentioned the uh, LGBTQ plus training 
that was earlier in the week. That was phenomenal. I, I did it. I've done a few in the past, but this one was well done, much more comprehensive than any of the other trainings I've uh, had the pleasure of taking part in. It was difficult because it's over Zoom, but it was still just uh, great information. So um, I know that we're looking into doing uh, follow-up uh, pieces. And then we have a scheduled uh, day of sharing for uh, faculty and staff. It's going to be on Friday, December 4th from 12 to 3 p.m., where we can all get together and talk about concerns or talk about little pockets of information that we all have that we can incorporate into classes, incorporate into our dealings with students and any of those things. All right, there he is. And uh, so that we can uh, move forward and help all of our uh, staff and students as we finish out the semester. And then uh, one other thing that we have that's gonna be next Tuesday is our, uh, it's a chair retreat. We haven't had those in a while because trying to manage how to do them over uh, COVID has been difficult. And then uh, with all of our retirees and we keep pulling them back for more work, Michael Delaney is the one that used to uh, do those for us. Um, so we've uh, incorporated uh, some of the ideas and things in the past. We'll be doing a chair retreat this Tuesday that uh, will help get uh, different information out for our chairs to share with uh, all the different divisions and departments. Um, and that's all for my College Senate report. Our next meeting is the 8th. I encourage you all to uh, try to attend or watch the stream after the fact. And uh, I would like to wish all of you a um, small but wonderful gathering of Thanksgiving with uh, your family or friends. And uh, be safe, be warm, and uh, enjoy. And I'll see everyone in December. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen. So you much, too. Colleen. You too, Colleen. It was actually a great meeting. So thank you so much. And I look, I, I watched via Zoom, so I had VIP access last time. So I was happy about that. But I'll be, I'll continue to watch the Senate meeting. So thank you. You're welcome. Zoom via YouTube. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, YouTube. There's so many different platforms. It's <laughs> hard to keep them straight. I know. Um. So is there, is there any old business? Any new business? I just want to say um, before we head out to executive session that um, I just want to send some light and love to all the families who are and everyone who may be just struggling during this time and having, you know, so much transition and so much change and having to deal with this new way of living is sometimes very heavy for a lot of people. And so if I can just offer to all of you, all of our faculty, our staff, and especially our students, just to hold on, reach out to someone who loves you, because I'm sure there is someone who does. Talk as much as you can, even when you think no one is listening. And just take care of yourself. Remember that at the end of the day, you are loved. There is positive energy around you. And someone, someone somewhere is able to help you. I just want you guys to remember that as we, we continue on this journey together. It is nowhere easy. We are juggling everything under the sun. And I think almost it's unfair that the world is expecting so much of us um, and to, to continue to show up, be normal, be productive, be, you know, be just achieve a, a status of, just have a status of achievement, I should say, at any level. And it's difficult. So let's just be kind to ourselves. I think Amy said it other, be kind to each other. Uh, uh, Amy said it earlier. Be kind to one another. Um, and when you have a moment, just tell someone you love them. Tell some, Give someone a hug, um, even if it's Friday. And, 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 just, and, and just take care. Really just take care. So I just thought it was, this is necessary during this very difficult time. Um, 
happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you or however you celebrate this holiday. Um, we are two just having immediate family. So if anyone wants to zoom into the Wilson household, you are welcome to. <laughs> but um, find a table to pull up to via Zoom or via, you know, in person, however you choose to do it. And just and, and just be thankful that you are here one more day. So with that being said, um, I would like a motion to go into executive session. Hey, Lou, uh, just let me just pick up on one thing. <clears throat> Thank you. Those were very kind remarks. And to put a face on some of that, I, I'd like to officially just extend the condolences and sympathies from the entire board of trustees, all of our members, and everyone on this call, and everyone in the entire college community, to the family of uh, Keneal Clark, the student that we lost from our community this past week. That was tragic news. Uh, it's been on our minds. And we just want to... Uh, make sure that his family knows that we valued him as a member of our college community and that we will miss him and that uh, we will keep him thoroughly in mind as we try to create an atmosphere that gets the help to students that they need uh, to prevent future tragedies and of this nature. So uh, God bless him. He's in our thoughts and prayers and to the entire family, our sympathies. Absolutely. Well, Seth, Joe. Just Thank don't. you. It's awesome. Thank you. Don't get me started. I know. <clears throat> uh, um, okay. Let's I take a deep go breath. into executive session. Thank you, Kate. May I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, everyone. If you don't Thank come you. back, we Happy will see you later. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye now. Happy Thanksgiving.
one thing I miss about working at home is my stand up. I have like a, a desk that rise up and down. Sitting all day for the birds. I'm with you. We're all set. Okay. Um, I would like to um, have a motion to call us out of executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Awesome. So we are currently out of the executive session. We're, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Vice Chair Stone, can you give us the proper wording that should be reflected in the minute? Yes. Uh, the uh, board was in executive session to discuss matters relating to the possible engagement and hiring of a particular person, uh, including a discussion of the uh, selection of a, a search firm to aid in the presidential search for the college. Thank you. Um, so, so at this time, we would like to take make a motion to vote on our selection for the presidential search firm. May I have a motion for the vote? I move to approve uh, the resolution. Um, are we putting language in for H AGB, right? right? So, yes, we are adding language to the current resolution. Well, do I, at this point, I'm sorry, somebody help me through this. Are we just, first we have to approve the resolution or we have to vote on the firm and then we need to approve the resolution, correct? Or can we do it all in one? I, I think Lens moved the um, motion to approve the resolution that chooses AGB. Correct. I will second it, and then we have discussion on any amendment that needs to be made to the language. Which, Thank Jeff, you. you want to take that, Jeff? Okay, so the motion's before us. Yeah. <clears throat> I apologize, Denise do you, uh, or Len, do you have to vote to add it to the agenda since it is not on the agenda at this point in time? Oh, correct. So thank you for reminding me. And we need to actually have that resolution read because it's ha it was not a part of the agenda. So, Madam Secretary. Yes. Will you please read the resolution? It'll go under new business. Um, and as I'm doing, I'm going to add the language at the end to include um, approval by the Erie County Legislature and then the attorney, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees resolution approving presidential search consultant firm dated today, November 19th, 2020. Whereas SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees in connection, excuse me, in conjunction with the administration of SUNY Erie Community College requested and ad advertised a request for proposal, RFP, for professional services in connection with the presidential search. And whereas based upon a detailed review and evaluation by an ad hoc presidential search firm committee of seven responses received, utilizing three sets of criteria, mandatory elements, technical qualifications and competence and price, as well as interviews of the top three firms. And whereas the firm of AGB search has exhibited and demonstrated the qualifications that will allow SUNY Erie Community College to actively seek and hire a new president for SUNY Erie Community College. And whereas SUNY Erie Community College has adequate funding available in its 2020, 2021 budget to fund those expenses, Sorry, I had a call coming in the middle of that and I had to hang up on it. Now I don't know where I am. I think I'm in the third, one, two, three, fourth, whereas. And whereas SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees can approve consultants' professional services agreements for up to $50,000. And whereas, as the recommended firm's price proposal of approximately $70,000 to $83,000, inclusive of all direct and indirect costs, final pricing proposal is currently being negotiated exceeds the SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees Party, it is recommended that the Erie County Legislature act to approve and recommend firm, such firm, and now therefore be it resolved. The SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees approves AGB search as the recommended firm to assist SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees in its search for the next president of SUNY Erie Community College, and be it further resolved that Certified copies of this resolution be forwarded to the Erie County Executive and Erie County Legislature seeking approval with the approval, excuse me, and be it further resolved that a contract will be executed with the search firm 
subject to approval by the Erie County Legislature and the Erie County Attorney. I could do that again. I'm sorry, I got interrupted in the middle. Did everybody understand it was as it was read? Kate, yep. take out the, um, the last reference to the legislature that I mentioned. When Bill responded to my question, he kind of pointed out that it, the, the second resolve clause talks about their need to approve it. And that what I'm worried about is if we pass it with that language that you just said and that I've mentioned, um, that we have to go back with the actual contract to the legislature to have them approve the contract. Uh -uh. We, we just okay. want to approve the concept of exceeding 50,000 and then delegate to the Erie County attorney the details of dealing with the contract. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought I asked a clarifying question, but I guess I was not clear. Yeah. So why don't I just reread the resolved? How's that? <laughs> sure. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees approves AGB Search as the recommended firm to assist the SUNY Erie Community College Board of Trustees in its search for the next president, SUNY Erie Community College, and be it further resolved that certified copies of this resolution be forwarded to the Erie County Executive and Erie County Legislature seeking approval, and be it further resolved that a contract will be executed with the search firm subject to approval of the Erie County Attorney. This is the resolution to which we are which we're voting on at this point. Right. That's good. That was moved, right? Did we have a second? Uh, yes, Kate seconded it. So we did have a sec second. Um, may I have a, let's take a vote. And should we do individual or just call? I can call the roll. So this is a motion to add this resolution to our agenda. Okay. Yes. Which Len moved and I seconded. So Todd Hobler? Approve. Len Lenahan? Approve. I approve. Carrie Phillips? Approve. Jeff Stone? Approve. Susan Swartz? It hurts my heart, but yes. Denise Wilson? Approve. And then we need a motion to approve that resolution that we just introduced, I believe. So moved. And I second. Todd Hobler? Approve. Len Lenahan? Approve. I approve. Carrie Phillips? Approve. Jeffrey Stone? Approve. Susan Swartz? Approve. Denise Wilson? Approve. All right, so um, that resolution has approved, been approved unanimously. And it's on the agenda. That's good. Thank you, everyone. Um, with that being said, if there is no other business, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Approve. Second. <laughs> and wish you all a very happy, yes, happy, happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care Be, safe. Well. Be safe. Bye bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. Good meeting, Danny.